started, I would like to introduce Dr. Pradeep Khosla. Uh, Dr. Khosla is the eighth chancellor of the University of California, San Diego, and a distinguished professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, before his current appointment, he was Dean of the College of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. And he is an electric member of, uh, and I'm going to try to get this all right, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Society for Engineering Education. He's a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the American Society of uh, Mechanical Engineers, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, the American Association of Artificial Intelligence, and the Indian Academy of Engineering. He's an honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Science. He also serves on various advisory boards for nonprofits uh, and government organizations, VC firms, and startups. Thank you for joining, joining us, uh, Chancellor Kosla. Over to you. Thank you, Reema, and thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm glad you stopped. I was afraid you were not going to stop. Uh, what we really want to hear from are the three distinguished panelists. We have assembled an amazing panel uh, to talk about uh, inclusive development and especially industries role in inclusive development. But let me say a few words about our panelists uh, so that you have a context. So when they talk, you know exactly where they're coming from. Uh, first up is uh, Mukesh Agi. Dr. Agi is the president and CEO of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, USISPF. He has extensive experience working with business and government leaders in the U.S. and in India to promote trade and strengthen ties between the two countries. Previously, Dr. Agi served as the chief executive at LNT Infotech uh, for people in this country, LNT's Larson and Tubra Infotech, chairman and CEO of Asia Pacific Region for Steria, the founding CEO of Universitas 21 Global and the president of IBM India. I don't think there is a job he's not had yet. So welcome, Dr. Agi. Uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, next up is uh, Raj Subramanian. Uh, he is the president and CEO of FedEx Corporation. He's been with FedEx in many roles since 1991. Uh, he champions the idea that FedEx connects people and possibilities around the world, helping businesses to flourish, economies to prosper, and standards of, living, standards of living to improve. In addition, Subramaniam is also a member of the board of directors of First Horizon National Corporation, the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, and the U.S.-China Business Council and World 50. And next up after that is Dheeraj Pandey. Uh, Mr. Pandey is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Nutanix. He brings a wealth of experience of working at high-tech growth enterprise software companies, including Astra Data, which is now called Teradata, and Oracle. His entrepreneurial spirit has been recognized with a number of prestigious awards, including Dell's Founders 50 and the ENY Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, he did his PhD work at the University of Texas, Austin, and holds a BS in CS from, the I, from IIT Kanpur, where he was a just the best all-rounder student amongst all graduating students in all disciplines. Uh, thank you. Congratulations, Dheeraj, for that. And Dheeraj is also on the board of Adobe, uh, Adobe Inc. So as you can tell, we have amazing leaders on this panel. Uh, so, and since we are talking about inclusive, our industry's role in inclusive development, let me just start by posing one question to each, uh, each of you, and you can take a couple of minutes to answer that. So the question in my mind goes the following way. What does equitable and inclusive development mean to you as an individual, as a corporate citizen, and as an industry leader? So let's start with uh, Mukesh, you want to go first, and then uh, Raj, and then Dheeraj, and I'll just keep on changing. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's important to understand that uh, beside government, corporate has a critical role in having inclusive growth, not only just for the stakeholders and shareholders, but also for the community. In fact, for the first time, the Business Roundtable, which is the largest group in Washington, DC, of the top 100 uh, US companies, they changed for the first time on five, uh, sorry, six different parameters as to how to judge co uh, corporations itself. Creating value for customer, investing in employees, dealing fairly and ethically with the suppliers, 
supporting our communities where we work and generating long-term value for shareholders. So from our perspective, I think corporation has a role not only just of uh, creating jobs, but bringing governance, making sure that this treatment of its citizens and community is equitable, and at the same time, providing value to its shareholders. So a corporate has a much, much stronger role to play, sometimes I would say more than government itself. So on that note, I'll pass it back to you, Pradeep. Sorry, Raj, do you want to go next? Sure, why not? Thank, then thank you, Pradeep. I, I would say, let me answer the question uh, three ways. Well, first of all, the stakeholders, that when we think about uh, exactly what Mukesh was talking about, you know, there's obviously our employees, there's our customers, uh, there's a share, owner, share owners and the community at large. And um, every time we look at the world, we see all our stakeholders. And when we think about activities regarding the community, I mean, you can think, think about it in three ways. One is just simply donating uh, money. I mean, that's, you know, that's the simplest way, but I, I don't think, you know, people sometimes will stop right there. There are two other much more important things that are, uh, that we believe in. This, the second part of it is in a use or expertise that we have to make a difference to the community. We are living through one of the, you know, uh, worst pandemics uh, that we have, you know, seen in our history. And uh, again, when it hit, um, you know, the fact that we have 700 airplanes and 180,000 motorized vehicles and 500,000 people, all those come in handy as we you know, literally have moved more than a billion masks and more than 60% of PPEs around the world uh, for this pandemic and, you know, working with the healthcare professionals. So that's an opportunity for us to use our expertise uh, to make a difference to the community. And the third, even deeper, is the whole notion of your core role as a business is indeed to connect people and improve standards of living around the world. And I, I, I know, you know, these days, uh, you're starting a business anywhere in the world and with a device like that and a system like ours, you can now access customers around the world. There are innumerable stories about artisans in India or, or a, uh, you know, a, 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 a hot sauce maker in, in, um, in the Caribbean or, somewhere in Africa, suddenly being able to access customers in the other end of the world. And in because of that, then improve the standards of living. So there's a core business function that we provide that also then provides a, uh, uh, provides a uh, function to the community. So that I'll, I'll just stop there, but I think I see it in three different stages like that. Deeraj, you Thank you. Next? Yeah, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Pradeep, and thank you, Mukesh uh, Raj, for really doing this. And thank you to the audience. I hope everybody is uh, and the loved ones are safe and well. And it's such an interesting time to be here uh, in front of everybody and yet not be really physically close to you. Uh, just goes on to say how much we need to really think about healthcare is a big issue. But coming back to what I believe, uh, I, I you know you usually believe in the power of three, and I believe in three words um, that will make it equitable. One is diversity. Uh, the other one is inclusion. Uh, and the last is democratization you know, of uh, work, healthcare, and education. So if you can think of diversity and inclusion where you're not just invited to the party, but you're also asked to dance, you know, that is a very important piece of this equitable uh, development puzzle. Uh, and then it's across gender and social and economic status. You know, obviously there's uh, a lot to be said about uh, all three of these uh, segments. Uh, but then finally, democratization of uh, work. You know, jobs, and we are in this, you know, very new world uh, world of globalization or whatever it means. You know, deglobalization. You know, there's a very parochial sort of sense that's emerging about what does it mean to have jobs locally. Maybe we overdid. Uh, manufacturing in China and such. So there's a lot of uh, discussion happening around jobs and to think about uh, reskilling people before we really think about a global supply chain. What about the local supply chain itself? So democ democratizing jobs, democratizing uh, healthcare, you know, with what's happening around us. Just in the last five months itself, the number of people who are from the lower economic status and, and what they're going through with COVID versus what uh, other people have gone through 
uh, in terms of the mortality rates and such, I think really talks about democratizing healthcare and finally education, you know. Uh, even today where I live uh, here in California, the public schools uh, are the have nots, you know, there's no Zoom for them while there's Zoom for private schools and such. So what does equitable mean with respect to education as we really think about remote learning, uh, remote dispersed jobs and uh, telemedicine and healthcare? So this is great. So great foundation for, for a conversation. So let me start with you here. So uh, I think we're all technologists, all three of us, including four of us are technologists. So as I look at technology and let's just take IT for example, right? And you make a good point where democratization of technology and access to information has created equity. Like in India, for example, the fishermen can be fishing and get the price of fish and the farmer can be farming and get the price of grain without the middleman. So that's a little bit more equitable than before. At the same time in the US, the same companies that are doing this have created more inequity where the market is going in one direction, the jobs are and the economy is going in the other direction. So help me understand this dichotomy out here. It just makes me completely confused as to how do I live in this society? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think uh, the US is grappling with this uh, because we did look at manufacturing to be completely siphoned away from the US. You know, And uh, that's where people talk about the, the rust belt, the steel belt, uh, the opioid crisis because people were not reskilled. Like, okay, what if all manufacturing moves to China? What happens to the people? Of course, the next generation is different and they come up with digital jobs for the next generation, but the current generation, people in the thirties and forties have lost their jobs. I think that is definitely an important issue. And coming back to India, the good thing is that we have not overdone uh, a lot of this manufacturing thing, yet we have to do a really good job of uh, thinking about jobs. There's uh, a pretty high unemployment in India that needs to be taken care of. And it cannot just all come from tech jobs. It has to come from other jobs as well. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's one of those where we need to think hard uh, and we have the uh, luxury of thinking about the last uh, 20 years of US to understand globalization and really figure out a way to disperse the power of Bangalore to tier two and tier three cities, you know, in terms of how you can really get the same kind of IT work done from tier two and three tier three cities, but also manufacturing wise, you know, uh, almost two thirds of India's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, deficit with China is really in three or four big things and, and electronics is one of them. Air conditioners is another one of them. So if you think of smartphones and the kind of import we do from China or air conditioners being the other one, you take care of these two, three things, all of a sudden you're talking about a more independent uh, country that really is able to do things on their own. So let me follow up with you, Mukesh, uh, based on what Dheeraj was saying, learning from the US. Uh, you being responsible for uh, building this great partnership between U.S. and India, like what are you doing in terms of public policy creation and sensitizing politicians in India to learn from the U.S. and not make the same mistake where we had enough inequity to begin with? How do we start reducing that instead of expanding that? Well, I think uh, when you look at U.S. India, as post-COVID era, we see a much more stronger uh, geopolitical alignment between the two countries. Now that's one. And what we're also seeing is a shift for, from US companies, which is looking at post-COVID China plus strategy, and India becomes a, one of the uh, destination for these companies to go in. I think more important is, is US companies are basically investing in India. They're bringing world-class jobs in India. They're creating R&D in India. And at the same time, they're bringing governance structure, uh, which is much more transparent in, in India. And also helping on what I call is on the environment side, on issues of social side, and also, uh, again, on, on the uh, bringing, uh, I call corporate governance. So to answer your question, I think, India, the challenge is while well, US has lost, is losing its middle class and, and the capital and the wealth is moving to top 1%. In India last 
10 years, what we're seeing is a middle class is growing. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that uh, while the middle class is growing, you still have almost 400 million Indians who live below the poverty line, which is below $2 a day. So the, the complexity and the seriousness of the problem India has is, is much different, much bigger. I think the challenge in India is, is quality of life. You know, do I get clean water? Do I get clean air? Can I get jobs itself? So to answer your question, the best thing we can do is, is move as much capital investment, job creating investment into India with, with, with the global, I call governance standards, which are conscious of the environment, social responsibility. And when we do that, the politicians, the policymaker, they see that and they emulate that. And hopefully we can have a positive impact on the environment itself. That's interesting. So Raj, let me come to you. So when I think about FedEx, I see on one extreme, I see trucks and drivers, but being a technologist, I know they're connected by a very complicated web of very high tech infrastructure. Uh, and for any economy to really become equitable and improve and expand, you need the ability to move goods and information from one point to the other. So clearly FedEx has an important role. Maybe you can help us uh, understand a little bit more about how does FedEx think about uh, equity in development and what is it doing for India and what impacts is it making? Uh, yeah, no, thank you for that. I think there are, so, uh, there are several parts of that you said. Let me just first say this. You know, obviously we have a very powerful uh, physical network that spans the world. We can pick up a package in any one part of the world and deposit any other part of the world in one or two or three days and requires a sophisticated infrastructure. But what people don't recognize totally is the information technology infrastructure that under, underlies that. In fact, in 1978, our founder was basically, the, you know, he said the information about the package is as important as the package itself. He said that in 1978, and mm -hmm. that was when the tracking and tracing and everything was born. So we have a strong technology DNA that under, under, underlies the FedEx story. And you know we're trying to get that out more and more in the external world. But that's that's very, technology plays a very very critical role for us. But let me go back to the broader point that you mentioned about trade. Ever since 1970 uh, till about 2016 or so, I would say, trade as a percentage of GDP has continued to increase. There are a couple of years here and there when that relationship didn't hold, but trade uh, in, as a grew faster than GDP. And at that, you know, high value trade grew even faster than you know, overall trade. So that means that the goods crossing international borders grew faster than goods that stayed within the border. That's what that means. So the trade represented roughly 25% of the global GDP. And it was, it was on a continuous increased path, but for a couple of aberrations in the middle, whether it's oil shock, Gulf War, things like that. That relationship since 2016 has now plateaued and there are more you know, we don't know where this is going to go from for now. And it's, it's an interesting change that has happened. So we're in the middle, because of all that, I, I would totally believe that the global standards of living have improved. That I, I will categorically state that. And that is, you know, first principles of comparative advantage is, you know, you produce the goods where it is the, the best, best place to produce it and, and you get it to the place where you need it. However, has the development been equitable and uniform? Absolutely not. And uh, so that, that obviously is an is a issue that has to be solved hand in hand. However, I would never take the reverse. I mean, the trade is, I think, is a, is a good thing. And so you just talk about US and India. I've been working shoulder to shoulder with Mukesh for a long time uh, on, the, on this issue. We firmly believe that the trade relationship from US and India back and forth, the potential for trade is significantly higher than it is today, maybe even five times higher. So, you know, the, if you remove the barriers, make it easier, and it, it's, it, there's an opportunity to improve trade at the same time, improve standards of living uh, uh, across the board here. So, mm -hmm. that I believe that too. And um, at the end of the day, uh, the manufacturing question that we just talked about. This is a wonderful opportunity for India right now. 14.7% of Indian GDP is manufacturing. A lot of companies are looking for alternatives for their supply chain. We, 
we kind of we are a, it's a referendum every single day because we see it every day and you know 20 million packages a day we see it and uh, people are looking for alternatives and this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for India to increase that share uh, and broaden the economy base. So Mukesh, let me go to you next. So like when I think about development, uh, I think about this being a government function only. I don't see why industry should care about development. When I think about equity or equitable and inclusive, I also see that as a more uh, overall good and a uh, government function. But clearly here we have three industry people, uh, leading stalwarts of American industry here talking about equitable development. Help us understand, what do you see as a role of public-private partnerships where industry works with government to really create equitable and inclusive development? Well, let me give you an example. You are on the board of TCS. Oh, geez, I knew you would bring that up. <laughs> uh, a, a Tata company. And Tata Sons is a trust. And you have the largest, largest uh, company in India from salt to software. Right. And, and they basically work trying to take the profit and go back and give it to society. They have hospitals, they have cancer center, they create jobs, they have a governance structure, one of the best governance structure you can find itself. To me, that's one of the best examples you can find of an organization which is owned by a trust. Uh, I think private-public partnership is very critical because mm. corporates bring in efficiency. They bring competitive environment. They bring R&D. They basically focus on, 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 on investment in the future itself. You have to understand technology leads and regulators follow and, and they seem to pull back technology all the time. So in every aspect, private public partnership uh, can play a very crit critical role. And you have to understand, in the United States and India, most of the jobs are created by private companies. And, and, and if these companies are able to innovate just like what US is doing, you'll see the standard and quality of life improving in India dramatically itself. So Raj, do you wanna address that issue too? Because I see like uh, FedEx might be considered to be a parallel uh, US post office or something, you know? And like- Don't come uh, how to the post office, please. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. But how, how do you work with the government and how do you see yourself uh, making an impact as a public-private partner on the Indian system, at least on the Indian side? No, I think, you know, this is the point, you know, I think it's very important. We, you know, we feel that our core purpose is connect people and possibilities around the world. And this is the point I was trying to make in the very beginning is that just because you make the, the network effects of connecting uh, folks from different parts of the world to each other. So suddenly as a, you know, if you start a business in any one part of the world, let's say India, I mean, it's incredible that these days when people start a business in India now, they don't think about the customer base as their village or the city or even the state or even the country. They, you know, very quickly, they move on to thinking about a global marketplace. And the only way, I mean, technology has gone a long way in making those connections, but it's easy, much easier to move bits and bytes, much more difficult to move the atoms. And that's what we do along with the bits and bytes. So, you know, when we do that, and we have seen example after example after example of customers and people around the world who suddenly had their, their, their businesses prospered beyond what they ever thought because now they're reaching a worldwide customer base. So by just our very core act of our business, we truly believe because of the connections we make that we are, that we are lifting the standards of living around the world. So that's, you know, along with the public-private partnerships that Mukesh talked about, I think there's a role to think about as a core aspect of your own business is also to do development work. Dheeraj, do you want to address that question from a software industry point of view? Because people think of yeah. India as the, uh, show the, the putting manpower for U.S. software companies, but uh, clearly there's more to India than that. No, absolutely. And I'm going to take the baton from Raj here. It's just good business. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, finally, the Aadhaar stack, which is the foundation of a, a lot of digital services that uh, the government had to build. 
And now the private sector is, in fact, if it's, it's the reverse, the government said, we want to be able to go do this. You know, Nandan said, I can help do this, you know, put together a bunch of people, open source came in. So there was again, a, a lot of uh, invisible public private stuff going on about crowdsourcing from open source, building on top of it, and then giving the APIs back to the private sector. I mean, the UPI uh, universal payments interface is yet another really good example where people are expecting to uh, pay others without having to really have cash. They don't have credit cards. How do you democratize the kind of technology that otherwise didn't exist? And Visa and MasterCard uh, are basically things of the year. People are looking for making payments from their cell phones. And the public private was a great example to really pull off two big things. You know, one, which is, a social security number equivalent. I think India has done a marvelous job there with the government taking this with some of the people coming from the industry to help build it, make it secure and such. And I think there'll be more of this. I mean, think of the elections that are gonna happen here in the US in the next three months, mail-in uh, you know, ballots and stuff like that. There's a lot that the public-private uh, sort of uh, partnership needs to come and solve for just to make democracies more secure. Right. You know, uh, right. I mean, this is just great business. My son, he keeps telling me that I should use the Ocean Hero uh, browser because we need to go and save uh, the oceans from all the plastic that gets dumped in. So now they're learning from very early on what does it mean to be environmentally conscious and friendly? Mm -hmm. I mean, independent mm -hmm. of which side of global warming are you on, whether it's man-made or not, we know that the earth is getting warmer. So what does it mean for us to really pick up from the millennials who are a lot more environment friendly and build a business that's conscious of that is great business. You know, let me start with that. I think you bring up a good point about the oceans, but let's just uh, expand that to the earth and global warming and climate change. You know, when people talk about software, they think it has no impact on the environment, which is exactly not true because the amount of computing it needs to run in the cloud is unbelievable and its power consumption is unbelievable. On the other extreme, when I look at FedEx and I see these trucks, it's clear to me there's an impact but uh, there could be all electric trucks, for example. So let me go to Raj first. Raj, tell me a little bit about uh, this climate change that is gonna have an impact on the lower paid and the poor people way more than the richer people, uh, climate, especially in India where there is a, a, the climate change impacts on the uh, lower socioeconomic group are worse than others. So what is like FedEx's view of like, how are you thinking what your CSR, your corporate social responsibility, what are you doing about that? That's an excellent point. So we, you know, obviously this is a very, the subject near and dear to my heart and uh, something very important to FedEx. And, you know, to, we can do the business we do without having a lot of physical infrastructure. Otherwise, you know, we haven't, we are not in the Star Wars beam me up Scotty world yet. So, you know, we, uh, <laughs> until we discover that, we're going to have to move these things. So we are on a continuous mission to improve uh, our uh, you know, carbon footprint every single day that we operate. So uh, you know, every time you know, we are replacing aircraft with much more uh, environmentally friendly uh, systems. Uh, you know, we are looking at fuel. We are looking at trucks, as you just said, uh, electric trucks, we are, we are rolling those out. We are putting, you know, our hubs are now, you know, con being converted into, you know, solar energy. Um, we are, you know, we're looking at robots, you know, from el using ele electricity. So uh, we are fundamentally looking at our carbon footprint every single day and making it better. Again, fully know knowing the fact that we we still need our, you know, physical movement. We need a, an extensive infrastructure to move it. So that's something that's, uh, again, very important for us. And... Uh, you know, it's something that uh, we have to work on every single day. Dheeraj, you want to take that from uh, the large power that you need to run the data infrastructure, <laughs> computing infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, before I get to the cloud of machines that basically uh, are power hogs and such, you talk about cloud of people. Look, uh, anybody who was in Bangalore in the 80s and the 90s, knows of the environmental damage that uh, software industry has come to cause, not uh, you know, directly, but indirectly, because 
the city just exploded 10x in a matter of 15, 20 years and completely unsustainably. You know, I think uh, so there's a cloud of people when they come together and you have a high concentration of talent in one city and it's not democratized, it's not dispersed. I mean, we do, we talk about this in architectures of software, you know, we call, we call it distributed systems. Mm -hmm. You need to have, uh, you know, things being distributed to multiple machines, no single point of failure, no single point of bottleneck. Well, what we did with Bangalore is we created a single point of failure and single point of bottleneck where anything, anytime something happens in Karnataka and there's a bund, you know, all companies see the effect of it. Like, wow, now employees can't come to work. I mean, the commute in Bangalore is, is, uh, is a real challenge and it's becoming an issue for San Francisco as well and Seattle as well. So we have to look at it sustainably. I mean, in fact, uh, because of COVID, now that uh, this notion of remote work is really gaining ground, it's possible that this black swan if event that actually happened in the last four or five months is going to really help us understand, take a step back and understand dispersion of work and dispersion of the cloud of people and the cloud of machines as well. I mean, you know, think about what globalization, um, uh, the new definition is. I mean, every country is asserting sovereignty of data. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of IoT and intelligent machines that are going to really drive data gravity issues because you don't have a pipe that's fat enough to take all the data to a large data center, to a large cloud mm -hmm. facility. So you're mm -hmm. going to have to disperse computing, not just disperse people. And you'll have to do it in environmentally friendly ways. So I think, you know, uh, this notion of dispersion is an important piece of the puzzle here, not just of manufacturing and factories and, and, and people, but also of the cloud itself that we have to go and really think about. So let's see, I'm seeing a couple of questions come up here. So one is about the role of industry in engaging and formalizing the informal sector. The informal sector, uh, as we know in India, is a black economy. That's when people get paid under the table and no taxes get paid. So as a CEO of a large software company, do you see it's your responsibility to formalize that or you just see that as employment uh, for Nutanix and that's it? Well, uh, we do want to make sure that, because if you think about uh, India's issue is really uh, corruption at the bottom of the pyramid, at the base of the pyramid. I think things are quite good at the, at the top of the pyramid. Uh, the judicial system is quite good at the top of the pyramid, especially Supreme Court and stuff. Uh, I think we do need to think about the base of the pyramid and how to digitize that. The more you digitize government services, the more you take middlemen out of it, the more predictable it becomes, the more people, I mean, think of just examples of Estonia, what Estonia has done with completely digital governance, you know, is just uh, amazingly, now it's only 4 million people. So you got to do this for not just 40 million, but almost a billion, three people. I think Aadhaar has basically been a great uh, foundation of that and a showcase to say that it can be done. But there are other informal things. I mean, even what Flipkart is doing in terms of the gig economy of India, what Swiggy is doing and others are doing where there's employment coming because of uh, commerce, e-commerce happening where uh, Uber and Lyft and Ola and all these things are helping create more jobs. I think it's great for the country in general and how some of the local companies have come up to really serve up local consumers. But there's another piece of this around microfinance, which I think Bangladesh did a really good job of. It hasn't taken off as much except for uh, parts of the country where it has. I mean, access to uh, relatively cheaper loans for people who don't have a credit history is gonna be a really good way to make uh, development equitable. So I get that, right? But uh, let's see. So I'm like FedEx. I'm going to go to you, Raj. Like, do you see your company or you playing a role in this micro loans and other issues that are important to the lo local economy? But is that, you think, your responsibility as an industry to deal with that? I think our responsibility, honestly. I mean, we, you know, uh, as you know, a lot of companies do, operate at the highest levels of integrity uh, and you know, around the world. And uh, we stand for that every single day. The best we can do, honestly, is to be an example and to be able to uh, not bend 
uh, to when there are when there are other um, when there's corruption or you just completely stand the ground and make sure that you do the right thing, and that's that's what we can do. Uh, I don't know lead by example, and when we expand our business in multiple markets around the world, including India, you know we do the right thing and stand on the side of integrity every single day. Um, beyond that, we you know as we as these businesses like ours start to expand uh, and grow, then hopefully there is a gravity that naturally takes a, a, a effect. But uh, we can really help in this particular regard. So Mukesh, to you now, like what do you guys, like your organization, what do you do about uh, leveling the playing field for the companies, uh, eradicating uh, uh, corruption, you know, just making sure there's opportunity for the companies to operate fairly, opportunities for people to be hired fairly in India. Like any, do you see any role in your organization? We, we, we uh, play a very strong role there. Uh, you know, we have uh, approximately 300 companies, US companies whom we support in India and in the last four years, they have invested over $60 billion in India, creating 3.2 million high paying jobs. And we work with the government to make sure that there is a transparency in the policy making. There is predictability in the policy making. Mm -hmm. We work with the government to encourage other companies to look at India as a potential destination uh, to invest and create jobs and, and go after the market share. And you have to give credit to government of India. If you look at today, Google, Uber, Facebook, Amazon, WhatsApp, they dominate the Indian market and they've been shut out completely from Chinese market. So, you know, we keep on working with the prime minister's office, with the commerce minister, and we go down to the industry level uh, and, and yes, there are times we, we don't succeed. This government uh, under uh, Prime Minister Modi has been much more receptive, much more open to have a dialogue with the industry and, and make sure they're able to provide a much more transparent level playing field to US companies so they can compete more effectively and efficiently. Right. One more so thing, me... Pradeep, I, can I, if I were to add one more thing, Please. you asked about specifically what do software companies, what can they do and what should they do? I mean, beyond just the fact that it's good business. Uh, we have a concept of a voluntary time off, which uh, we call VTO. And it's an important way to build a team culture as well. You know, you go out there and you really understand uh, what it means to help within the community, but with your team members, it really goes and disarms a lot of the, it diffuses the tension in the office. You go out there and help, uh, you know, the have nots. So this idea of voluntary time off is a very important piece of the puzzle and it's really good business as well. So if you look at our values, we, we talk about hungry, humble, honest with heart, you know, the word heart is very important. And we've done a lot of work with uh, like girls of code. Like it's really important to get the diversity piece figured out with engineering, within engineering and computer science. And it's just great business to really go and diverse, diversify the engineering workforce as well. We worked with Akshay Patra in Bangalore, for example, where uh, we actually go to get some food delivered from uh, their kitchen because we have uh, lunches delivered in our office. Our people go out there and help out uh, within the uh, community of Bangalore and Pune as well. So this notion of uh, you know voluntary time off for our employees also helps a lot in terms of building a better business. So I'm just curious, does that factor into your CSR computation when you give voluntary time off? Does that, uh, can you use that for your corporate social responsibility contributions or is that not part of it? Well, I don't know the math of the business uh, because it's, sometimes it's hard to quantify uh, <laughs> you know, what it would be uh, no, no. within the community, but I think it has to come from within. It has to come right. as a very authentic measure because if you use it as a checkbox, then everybody takes it as a checkbox. But if you say, look, there's value in having diversity in the workforce, therefore we should go to uh, you know, colleges that actually have a better representation of women. 
but also like, for example, in the last six months of what's happening in the US with social justice, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, we are having to think really hard about going to historically black uh, colleges and universities as well. Like what does it mean to go and hire from there uh, is just a very important piece of this equitable uh, sort of development that we're talking about now. So, you know, companies are only as good as their leaders or maybe their governance structure, right? So in the US, uh, I think if I look at uh, the Fortune 500, I would not be shocked if more than 50 CEOs of these large companies are of Indian descent, uh, people like the three of us and me, four of us are sitting out here. Uh, and I think that's a matter of pride for us. But when I go to India uh, and I look at the governance structure there and the leadership there, somehow I find that we are not transferring everything from here to there very effectively. So SEBI, for example, only recently figured out uh, how to have better governance structures. Can you comment a little bit about how the Indian companies are being governed more effectively with more transparency now? Maybe Mukesh, you can start. You've got to work on both sides and then I'll go to Raj and Deeraj. Well, I think uh, the Indian companies uh, in the last 20 years have raised the bar. Uh, they have changed. And when I say raise the bar, you know, again, the shining example would be the Tata Group. Uh, you know, they can compete from a governance perspective with any of the Fortune 500 companies around the world. What we are seeing is, is, is the IT industry, which has taken the lead in governance. And, and if you look at companies like TCS, you look at Infosys, you look at Wipro, uh, they are on a global basis, just like any other IT company. And what we are seeing is as you go down, the startup scene in India, their governance structure is influenced by the investors. And most of the large investors are coming from the US. Yes, you have Chinese investors, but what we are seeing is the governance factor is coming more from the US perspective itself. So, so I think India has gone way, way ahead. When you look benchmark with Asia, I sit on a board of uh, Hindustan Times uh, in India. Yeah. Uh, it has a world-class governance structure can compete with anybody anywhere in the world itself. So I think uh, overall things have changed. It can go better, but uh, I would say the, the country, the, go, the governance structure and uh, is moving in the right direction in India. Okay, thank you, Mukay. So let me ask uh, Raj, I'm gonna ask you guys a different question because uh, here's a question which I think uh, both uh, Raj and Dheeraj uh, will have some say. How can large corporations accelerate development in underrepresented and under underrepresented, underdeveloped areas, especially in the context of India. There's a whole lot of territory that is completely underrepresented or underdeveloped. So what, how do you see your role as uh, helping them out in development? Raj, you want to start? No, I think it's, you know, for us, it's pretty straightforward. It goes back to the, from the notion of providing physical connectivity. Mm -hmm. And the way we, since we are a network business, and we have this global networks, any part of any, any, any new part that we connect, it's automatically connected to the whole network. So you don't have to, you know, draw a, a wire from the core of the earth and connect everywhere else. It's automatic, you know, all we need to do is connect any particular <coughs> developing area to the core of our, one point in a network and boom, you're, you know, you're connected to everywhere. So that's exactly, you know, when you don't have a network, you can do that, you know, but when we already have a network, we can provide these network effects, which are very, very important. So we have done this constantly. And <clears throat> when we start building our business in a particular country, India, you know, we start off with, uh, you know, obviously the major markets and so on, but, you know, surely we move on to other markets. And so now we have presence all across India and we serve, you know, zip codes that, you know, count for 90% of the GDP we have thousands and thousands of FedEx employees now in India, and and we continue to expand as business expands. Boom, we you know we 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 add add these uh, nodes to the network, and so it makes good business sense. It makes good sense for development, and you know and brings all good practices uh, to these areas. So that you know that's it's a pretty straightforward for us in that respect. Mm -hmm. Deeraj, what about uh, what's your? Yeah, I mean you know as. Uh all of us know that the biggest investment we can make in uh, any 
underprivileged piece, uh, you know, segment of society is education. So apprenticeship, you know, or internships, if mm-hmm. you can actually uh, get that right uh, in these uh, underrepresented sections of the country by going in. And by the way, it's great business because there's nothing better than internships to really hire the hungriest people. You right. know, the hungriest people come from, you know, and we can do that for three to six months. We can observe them. And it's the best way to interview them. And at the same time, we are skilling them. So I think between apprenticeship, internships, uh, and finally volunteer work, you know, uh, where employees can actually go and and do this uh, in one of their adopted sections of uh, the country uh, with volunteer time off. I think these are some great ways to teach. I think there's nothing better than teaching in some sense, you know. Mukesh, you want to have the last word on how you are enabling companies that you bring to India to help them uh, see the underdeveloped and the un, uh, underrepresented areas and uh, are, do you see them pushing back? Do they all want to go to Mumbai and Bangalore and Delhi or do they want to go to regions of Assam and uh, Odisha? So what we are seeing, and we're working with different states and, uh, and work, making sure that their policies to attract these companies are competitive hmm. and you know before destination used to be Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu uh, and, and now what we are seeing is companies are being going to eastern part of India they're going to smaller states uh, which are much more responsive to these companies uh, environment and we're working with these companies also uh, sorry with these states also not only compete with the state itself, but raise their benchmark. So they are able to compete with countries like Singapore, Vietnam, mm-hmm. Cambodia. And, and you know, we have done constantly supplied white papers and studies to go to India uh, to see what they need to do from labor reform to land reform. In fact, it was our recommendation. They brought their tax or manufacturing down to 15%, uh, very competitive itself. So we basically, push and nudge uh, state level, and then within the state level, district level, to encourage them to reach out to these companies to come and invest and create jobs in the district itself. Look, I'm being told I'm running over time, but let me just say a brief thank you to each and every one of you. I know you had better things to do. I know Raj has to get on a phone call, but I really, really appreciate your insights. Uh, I hope the audience enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, and I look forward to meeting you all in person, actually, one of these days and having the same conversation in person over a glass of wine. So thank you very much. And please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Was that okay, Rima? Uh, We actually have 10 more minutes to go. We have quite a few questions from the from the attendees. I oh, shoot. I was told like uh, 520. I was told 50 minutes. OK. Well, uh, yeah, we we actually did have uh, 60 minutes uh, for the session. Oh, I'm sorry. It, but like my briefing out here says 50 minute panel discussion. Oh, OK. Uh, OK. Well, no that's fine. So we have, yeah. Oh, I'm we sorry. <clears throat> Where okay. are the questions anyway? Like. Uh, um, so I've been posting the questions in the WhatsApp group for you, like the summary questions. Okay, yeah, no, no, I've, I've been seeing that. Okay, all right. Apologize for no that. No worries. No worries. All right, so let's move on to the next uh, group. Thank you so much, Pradeep. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, bye. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, that was a very engaged and passionate discussion. Um, and now I am delighted to invite uh, Dipali Khanna, Managing Director, Asia Region for the Rockefeller Foundation to introduce the global plenary session. Uh, good morning, Dipali. Over to you. Good morning, Rima. Good morning, Rima. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Rima, and of course the Nudge Foundation. And of course, to all those who have been intently listening in on the discussion so far, they've been fascinating. A very warm welcome to all the newer audiences joining in from Australia, New Zealand, Far East Asia, and South Asia, as the Nudge Forum is following the sun to this geography. I'm here in uh, Bangkok, and it's about 7.20 in the morning. 
We at the Rockefeller Foundation are very excited to be co-hosts for the Nudge Forum and to bring stakeholders together for India on its 74th Independence Day. The COVID-19 crisis has been a watershed moment for organizations and individuals from all walks of life to come together to the bastion core of humanity, be it the private sector, governments, and even individuals volunteering their time. COVID-19 has ushered a reckoning that systemic change needs a collaborative ecosystem. This is where philanthropy has played the most foundational role. Philanthropies have been nimble and agile in response to the crisis because they aren't restrained by the social contract that governments have with their citizens, neither are they trying to meet bottom lines. This allows the philanthropic capital and efforts to act in a way more malleable and creatively. Today, philanthropy entails partnering shoulder to shoulder with the government, supporting and sustaining civil society to carry on their rights-based work, unlocking private capital to amplify potential impact, investing in big and risky bets for systemic change, and creating platforms where actors who might not have been uh, spoken before can come together to actualize breakthroughs. It's truly an honor to introduce the global, global plenary session of this convening, deliberating upon the present and the future philanthropic work in India. We have two inspirational leaders, both of whom I've known for almost a decade and can safely say are key cogs in making philanthropy all the more relevant in today's world. Without further ado, I present to you a pre-recorded session with Dr. Rajiv Shah, president of the Rockefeller Foundation and Donald Gibbs, CEO of Skoll Foundation in a fireside chat moderated by Natalie Kailander, managing director of DRK Foundation. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Natalie Kylander. I'm a managing director at the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. And on behalf of the Nudge Foundation, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this fireside chat uh, with Don Gibbs, who's the CEO of the Skull Foundation, and Raj Shah, uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, at DRK, we work to support social entrepreneurs addressing important problems and help them to scale their impact. We're grateful to have had the opportunity to support the Nudge Foundation in the early days, and it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce you to two incredible partners and leaders, Don Gibbs and Raj Shah. Don is the CEO of the Skoll Foundation, where he leads the organization's work, investing in, connecting, and celebrating change leaders who are driving lasting social change around the world. His experience spans public service, politics, business, finance, and technology. Raj serves as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a global institution with a mission to promote the well-being of humanity around the world. Under his leadership, the foundation applies data science and innovation to improve health for women and children, create nutritious and sustainable food systems, and end energy poverty for more than a billion people worldwide and enable meaningful economic mobility in the United States and around the world. The overall theme I'd like to draw on today is that of collaboration, collaboration across organizations and sectors, and the coming together of a variety of partners to really drive social change in India. This includes diaspora and allies from across the world and also stakeholders from governments, business, and civil society. So my first question to both of you, Raj and Don, it's such an honor to be here with you today at this global convening of some of the biggest believers in collaborative action. And both Rockefeller Foundation Skoll have amazing track records, but COVID is all we read or we hear about or we talk about. And I'd like to ask you, what are your respective organizations doing to fight the pandemic? And how do these actions fit in with your respective commitments to solve problems without borders? Don, let me start with you. Uh, glad to start and uh, just such an honor to be here with Raj, who's a dear old friend and 
somebody that we're, <laughs> we're incredibly excited to be working with and with DRK and with Nudge, all of whom are such great examples of how to work collaboratively. Um, and for Skoll, this is quite a moment. Uh, for those of you who don't know Jeff Skoll, our founder, uh, he really has been a platform builder his whole career. Uh, started with eBay. When he retired from eBay, decided to really devote the rest of his life to making a difference in the world and built three platforms to do that. One is Capricorn, which was one of the early impact investment arms. The second was Participant, which was uh, uh, to basically a platform to allow great artists to tell stories of social change and to drive narrative. And the third uh, is the Skoll Foundation, his philanthropic arm. And as a part of that, 11 years ago, he started uh, an organization called Ending Pandemics because he saw pandemics becoming a huge existential threat to the world. He had, participant ran the movie Contagion, which sadly predicted sort of where we were going to be at. And in January, uh, through the Ending Pandemics organization, which we still fund, uh, he sort of heard about what was coming. He came to us and said, this is a moment uh, that we've all been fearing. Uh, he immediately, he basically said, we're going to quadruple our funding and we're going to run both the sprint and the marathon around the world to figure out where we can make a difference to bend the arc of this disease. Everything from uh, uh, both medical invention interventions to trying to support those uh, most marginalized communities who've been so uh, devastated by this virus and recognizing that we needed to do this in collaboration with others, that we couldn't do it on a standalone basis. And we've been doing that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our original vision was that we would start in Africa because the health systems were so weak and we didn't expect what would happen in our own country in the US. Um, but in Africa, we've started working with leading philanthropists and with Raj and Rockefeller, and we've helped uh, both fund the Africa CDC, which is sort of overseeing a systemic response, working with governments, as well as a private sector entrepreneur, Strive Masawiya, who's built a supplies platform just so that Africa could get access to tests and PPE and oxygen supply. So very excited about that. But then we saw the virus spreading to South Asia. Um, we're working at the Indus, Pac Indus Hospital in Pakistan, but also working with groups like Nudge who created the Hope Fund to respond, bringing together philanthropists and, uh, uh, and others uh, to, to drive change. So we're in a, a sprint and a marathon and uh, so excited to join with Raj and work he's pioneered in the US around a, a compact with governors for testing that I'll let him talk about. But it, it's just, this is a moment where philanthropists need to work with the private sector, with government to help s catalyze and stimulate change. Uh, and uh, just uh, groups like Nudge who are doing that in South Asia are making a huge difference. Thank you, that's so inspiring. Uh, Raj, I'd love to hear from you as well. I know you're doing a lot of work in this area. Well, thank you, Natalie, and thank you for uh, having me and the Rockefeller Foundation be part of this conversation. It's great to be with uh, my friend Don Gibbs, who, for whom I have tremendous respect, and, and frankly, the Skoll uh, institutions, plural, which have been, as Don points out, really early voices for uh, scanning the world, understanding things that could threaten to disrupt uh, human progress and human potential for hundreds of millions or billions of people at once, and then working to help the world prepare for that well before COVID-19. It was a tremendous act of foresight, and uh, and Jeff deserves a lot of credit for it, as as does Don. I I uh, I'm so glad to be with a primarily Indian audience. Uh, I was in Bihar in November, and I had one of the most extraordinary visits. Uh, that I've had to India, and I've had many over the years, as you might imagine. Uh, but we were in rural Bihar, and we were uh, walking through villages, 
uh, talking to families, meeting uh, kids who are in school, and understood that one of the big things holding back the, many of the communities we visited was whether or not they had electricity. They would literally wait uh, and not know if the power was going to go out or not. And that is, is such a common experience for those who have spent time in emerging markets and, and rural communities in particular. And through our Smart Power India program, the Rockefeller Foundation now uh, reaches more than 400,000 Indian families and helps them get access to renewable, reliable electricity. And it's been a 10 year endeavor and it has shown that India's poorest families will reliably pay for power so long as the power itself is reliable. And they'll then use that access to electricity to move themselves, their families and their whole community uh, up the ladder of opportunity, out of poverty, creating jobs, supporting enterprise growth and allowing girls to read at night uh, in, at home. And, you know, that kind of progress and potential was just so exciting because you could see hundreds of millions of people in India. We partnered with Tata Power to launch a billion dollar collaboration. You could actually see hundreds of millions of people moving up economically and moving up in terms of their access to dignity, to opportunity and to a global economy. And COVID-19 has set that backwards. Uh, we, we now know on a global basis that maybe four to 500 million people will be pushed back under the $5 a day poverty line. That was a World Bank estimate from just uh, June. Almost every leader I speak to acknowledges that when you look across the next decade, it's likely to have real, uh, a real big step back in human progress for the world's two billion people who, who live you know, at the bottom of the economic ladder. And so the Rockefeller Foundation has committed itself to really uh, aggressively investing in a data-driven and effective response and uh, committing ourselves fully to supporting a global recovery that for once includes the voices and the presence and the needs and the urgency of the world's most vulnerable people. Uh, on the response, we've been very active, as Don notes, in supporting testing, contact tracing, the basic things you have to do to run a pandemic response, which are known to so many people around the world uh, because we've been through so many of these pandemics, and yet it's very difficult. So the United States has sort of notoriously gotten this really, really wrong. Uh, we have a testing and contact tracing and public health messaging system. Those are the three core elements of responding to a pandemic that are absolutely off balance. Uh, our, it takes seven days to turn around a test in America that makes uh, taking people who are contagious out of the chain of transmission impossible. We don't seem to trust uh, public health officials enough to share data on contacts and it's hard to recall who you were with a week ago. And our messaging from uh, from the top down has been uneven, and that's probably a very kind and politically, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> mild uh, comment to make. So, so the reality is, Rockefeller, the Skoll Foundation, we're holding hands with uh, ten governors in America in a compact to help the governors get access to the kinds of rapid turnaround tests and improved approaches to contact tracing and public health messaging that will allow them to drive an effective response in their state, in part because the federal response in the United States has been so uneven and so challenged. And I'm thrilled that Jeff and Don uh, stepped up and are holding our hands to do this. They, they have all the credibility in the world given the focus they've had on pandemics for so long. And, uh, and we're gonna make some progress. We're, we're very focused on the antigen tests which are new rapid turnaround tests, slightly less sensitive, but, but very effective. Uh, and and we, were, we were the first entity, I think, in America to launch a national testing plan and program, which we called the 1330 plan. We were stuck at about 600,000 uh, tests a week, and we said we need to get to 3 million and then 30 million over the course of the next five to six months in order to have an even response. Today, America, six months in, is not at 30 million, we're at 5 million. And that's part of why we're, we're failing so badly. Uh, I will say I'm very proud that we've been active in India as well on COVID. And our, our Smart Power India programs 
and partners, some commercial, some nonprofit, have offered uh, energy and electricity vouchers to all their customers. They have taken care of uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of their employees and avoided uh, COVID outbreaks in their businesses. They've maintained infrastructure and they've kept the power on through a crisis that would otherwise be debilitating. Uh, we've launched a major pandemics effort in India that, uh, ironically, India uh, quickly followed the, uh, the the plan and created their own testing plan, I think, called the 1510 plan. And we have supported uh, Indian research institutes to create uh, rapid access PCR testing at scale for screening and clinical diagnostics across India. And that's something we're proud to have launched in Bangalore, but in, in a partnership with the Indian government. Um, I guess the message I take away from all of this for your listeners is just, you know, there are times when uh, we all want to be known for what we get done. There are times when we just want to hold hands with others and actually deliver results. And in the crisis of this moment and in the urgency of it, I, I just hope more uh, partners will uh, do what Skoll has done and just said, look, we want to, we'll work with anyone, public sector, private sector, philanthropy, scientists, industry. Uh, let's let's kind of reach across partisan and political divides and do the right thing to deliver results for the world's most vulnerable because we know that every time there's been a crisis and every time there's a global and local effort to support a recovery, it leaves out the most vulnerable people. That is true time and time again. And it's likely to be even more true this time without real concerted leadership and action. Thank you, that's uh, phenomenal and gives us hope, I think, both here in the US, but also um, everywhere where COVID is such a ravaging uh, problem um, and really increases the vulnerability, as you mentioned, Raj, for millions of people. I, I had another question for you, Dan, I, Don, sorry. I think you often speak about um, transformational social change at school. What do you think are the fundamental shifts that are required as we look beyond this pandemic um, towards the 2030 SDGs, for example, to, to really, um, you know, to Raj's point, reimagine a future that works for all. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think first, first we have to take care of this pandemic. Uh, and this is another area Raj and I are working on. I, I think for transformation, if, if we can't figure out how to come together as a global community coming out of this to be able to respond and build a long-term scaffolding that protects us from future pandemics, then there's sort of very little hope on other issues like climate and, and global poverty that are further uh, or less imminent and less, uh, I mean, you just can't imagine and it just it doesn't cost that much uh there have been plans to do it raj can talk in detail because he wrote them when he was at usaid and has been on global commissions there's an opportunity to bring the globe together both not just the international institutions but we fund something ending pandemics funds local disease detection networks and gideon which we fund helps create lab capacity in lower and middle income countries so that you can build this global scaffolding. That's such a huge opportunity to prove to the world. Now that we've suffered through this, we don't have to do it again. And that I believe creates the scaffolding for solving a whole range of problems going forward. Um, at the same time, and this is uh, something we feel very strongly at Skoll, we have to continue to support those who've been working on the SDGs and driving change at the local level for years and with the the uh, economic crisis that's coming continuing to support these locally led organizations who are driving change and for us in india educate girls and pratham and graham Beekus, foundation for ecological security barefoot college and selco are examples of prize winners that we've had that we are now doubling down in our efforts to make sure they can continue their, their work through this period. And they're all pivoting to figure out how to make a difference. So I think it's this combination of working at the local level, but also trying to figure out how you build that global scaffolding. 
to support things. Thank you. That's great. I'd like to build on this, um, Raj, and turn to you this notion of, you know, really relying on building capacity in the communities uh, where where uh, you work and, and also working with governments across the world. Um, I'd love to hear from you what, what have been some of your key learnings in terms of really engaging um, you know, local communities, local governments, um, and, and how does this dovetail with some of the large, large programs that you've been involved in? Well, well, you know, I, I think some of the learnings are are that um, first you have to reach out and find collaborators, and often that means uh, not always being right about everything, and <laughs> listening to others and aligning with their strategies. I'll give you an example. When we started the effort around testing and contact tracing globally, um, I have been and remain very committed to antigen testing, as well as, you know, I think in a few months, the world will, will shift to lateral uh, flow assay tests, which are like pregnancy or HIV tests that can be done safely at home with high reliability and security. Uh, but the Indian government uh, has prioritized PCR testing and efforts to make PCR testing, you know, uh, broad, ubiquitous and fast because of its higher sensitivity. And to some extent, that's a more difficult scientific path uh, than I was initially proposing. But we are uh, less interested, frankly, in being, you know, uh, technically on one side or another and more interested in holding hands with the government and, and ensuring that private companies, research institutes, government and philanthropy come together to drive a real testing strategy for India. So this is the one we're getting behind and, and now we're seeing this very rapid progress uh, with all the Indian research institutes creating really important breakthroughs on PCR testing and high throughput uh, evaluation in that context. So. You know, the, the first thing is just being open to genuine collaboration um, and in a manner where it doesn't have to be your idea. It's, it's really what's best for uh, who's in charge and how to help them be successful. I think the second thing is to be very clear about the goal. Uh, again, I think when we did the 1330 plan or India did the 1510 plan or, you know, in any of these examples, clarity around what you're trying to achieve, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, Immunize Every Child in the World, uh, global fund for AIDS to be in malaria, you know, it's obvious what the goals are. That sort of clarity around the goal is exceptionally important. And then we have to stick with it for 10, 15, 20 years, because that's what it has proven to take to deliver the kind of outcomes and results. And by the way, for for people like uh, Bill Gates or Jeff Skoll or Nanda Nilakani or or others who built companies from from scratch, you know, staying focused for 20 years is how you get it done, right? It's not, no, not, not one of those folks succeeded in the first 18 months. So I, do, I, think, I think that sticking with it against a goal is another big lesson. And then I'd say a final, a final lesson is really genuinely being um, adaptable. Like I, I've been surprised by, not surprised, I've expected this, but you know, I'm, I'm pleased that major institutions we've all been a part of crafting uh, whether on pandemics uh, prediction or epidemiological surveillance or vaccine production and manufacturing in India, Serum Institute of India is a good example, have been able to pivot, you know, to COVID-19 in a, with a kind of open mind. And, you, you know, other people can comment on this history, but I think had it not been for the 20 year collaboration around childhood immunization, I'm not sure the Indian vaccine industry would have the capacity it now has to shift that capacity to the massive scale up of potential uh, vaccines for, for the world to, to utilize and particularly for India and emerging economies with very large vulnerable populations. So I, I just think that ability to be adaptive is, is really important uh, and really critical. So we're, we're trying to, what we've learned, for example, in our power work in India, is that we initially started by, I think, you know, distributing uh, flashlights, solar powered flashlights and cubes and things that, uh, you know, really did improve the quality of life in some small settings. But we quickly learned that what will both drive business success and what people really want is to get uh, enough reliable power that they can use it for productive commercial use. And whether that is 
hauling rice or, uh, or, you know, actually powering a business that's creating construction jobs for four or five, six other people. Uh, it's much, much, much more energy intensive than solar powered flashlights and, and the kinds of things that got more attention maybe 10 years ago. So being able to adapt, listen and learn based on data and evidence is, is the other kind of lesson learned for me. That's great. And I think, you know, those are lessons that we could apply at the individual level too. I think, you know, being open to hear what others say, um, being focused on the goal and being adaptable. Um, I think those are great um, tenants to live your life by as well as sort of run an organization by. So thank you. It's, that's probably harder to do, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's pretty much all hard to do. But yeah, this is this is wonderful. Um, I, I wanted to sort of close out um, by asking you both, I feel like we're in a time where we need a, some optimism. And I, I'd love to ask you, really, what inspires you most today as we are waging war with a pandemic, looking at a deep economic crisis heading our way in the next coming years? What, what um, Don, maybe I'll start with you. What inspires you most today? Uh, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I'll start with the frontline workers who are uh, around the world uh, putting themselves at risk to, um, to save other people's lives, often underpaid, uh, whether they're community health workers or uh, um, doctors or nurses. It, it's truly uh, remarkable to see the selflessness, the coming together. And then, you know, we're also seeing, and it's, <laughs> I never thought I'd see as much progress as we've seen in the US in the past, since the George Floyd moment of people recognizing that we have to change some of these structures and systems. And the battle still has a long way to go, but even the fact that, for those of you who followed, uh, NASCAR in the United States, they've re removed the Confederate flag. You know, people would have bet against that six months ago. So when it shows the power of people coming together and recognizing these systemic inequities, we cannot build the type of society that anyone can be proud of if we don't address them. And I think it you know, it's led by young people, it's led by the most marginalized, but all of us joining in, in that fight, and it, it'll give the energy that will move politicians and philanthropy has its role to play, but I'm incredibly inspired by that. Raj, what, what inspires you? Well, I, you know, what Don just described is a, is, is a awakening or a reawakening of our better values. And I think we see those better values in the, you know, if you're in the United States, in the essential workers who deliver food and medicines to your home, you see it in teachers being willing to go into a classroom with 10 or 12 kids and teach. You see it in uh, first responders who've had the courage and some have lost their lives. Uh, to be on the front lines of COVID response. And I, I have three uh, young kids, Don has kids. Uh, I, think, I think we see in those kids, people looking up to that kind of courage and those types of values in a way that's exciting for me to see. Uh, we also still look up to our sports stars, <laughs> which is great. Uh, but it's nice to see, you know, it's nice to see doctors and nurses and teachers and other essential workers being recognized for the heroes that they are and, and continue to be. Uh, and so the values and the reawakening of those common values is something I'm very optimistic about. And then the other piece of it is the sheer, you know, remarkable progress of technology. I think whether you look at digitization or biotechnology, information technology, the technological frontier is moving so fast. Uh, that we can envision batteries that can store power uh, and be durable and cheap in rural Bihar so that a mini grid of, you know, a set of solar panels that 10 years ago would have been somewhat useless in that setting today tied to smart meters and artificial intelligence and new battery chemistries can, can effectively power a village of five, 10,000 people and change their lives dramatically. Ironically, we've done that 
uh, but but Skoll has also, through Capricorn, a, a group Don mentioned, all, also invested in those types of technologies and brought them to the to the forefront. So the 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 movements on testing technology, on vaccines, even on some therapeutics, are moving faster than people would have expected because I think of the optimism and the energy that exists in the innovation sectors. Uh, so those things give me a lot of hope. And and one one final thing about where values and technology come together is in the spirit of just entrepreneurship. And uh, we've been really excited to support an effort called the uh, mass, a movement for mass entrepreneurship uh, called GAME in India. And you see these, you know, Indian CEOs, big companies get together with colleges and universities and training programs, and then with local communities. And you, you just get to see how they're able to unlock the capacity of people to be entrepreneurial and move themselves up. All of that is the combination of values and technology and an understanding that we're a stronger society if everyone's included. And uh, I just hope that those uh, characteristics that make me so optimistic about this moment persist over the next 18 to 24 months as the world begins to shape a recovery from COVID-19 because those are the values that will be most needed to succeed. And if I can just add one thing to what Raj just said, because I couldn't agree more. Um, this is a moment like none of us are ever likely to have in our lifetimes again, where these all these systems that we've been talking about will be reshaped and we all need to engage in the fight to reshape them, to capture it and the values that protect, that recognize the dignity of all people and, and bring those to the forefront. Well, I just want to thank you both so much. I definitely am feeling better than when we started this chat. And so I want to express gratitude to both of you and also to everybody um, that works in collaboration uh, across uh, sectors and across organizations, uh, really to bring meaningful social change uh, to people uh, who are vulnerable uh, everywhere in the world today. So gratitude to both of you. And thank you also to Nudge uh, for hosting this incredible uh, fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dipali, Don, Raj, and Natalie for setting the stage. And sincere thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation and the Skoll Foundation for all your support, the fantastic discussion, and the optimism that gives us all of us. We are all indeed in this together. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Santosh from the Nudge Foundation and I'll be your host this morning. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Nudge Forum Global Edition presented by uh, in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Skoll Foundation. We have a great lineup of speakers and events uh, for you today. Well, the pandemic has required everyone across the country to jump in and do their bit. While its effects on both health and humanity are in front are unprecedented, we should also acknowledge how much of the blow has been softened by the timely action of COVID heroes from all walks of life. Today, on Independence Day, we salute these heroes with a short inspirational video coming up that's been put together for you by the Josh team, after which we will have Vivek Maru's session on the global struggle for environmental justice. Hello everyone, my name is Shlok Jagushte and this is my friend Varun Kokhle and together we are the founders of Shubhashi Initiative. 12 different locations in 12 days and 4,500 people. This is how much uh, Shubhashi Initiative uh, has contributed in its lifetime. Uh, these 4,500 people that were fed through this initiative include the extremely needy people, the gypsy families, daily wage workers, they also include policemen, sanitation workers, as well as uh, umpan cyclone victims of Odisha and migrant laborers stuck in Maharashtra. We also serve the transgender community in Chennai. So the initial idea of the initiative came when uh, I used to distribute uh, sweets and savories made during festivities around my locality to the needy people. Uh, 
when I was in class 11. And then um, since this COVID-19 pandemic was a very severe one and had a large impact on our country, we decided that we could do our part as the government and NGOs did. So this is when we decided to help out the hungry and needy people out there by supplying them with cooked food packets and uh, even grocery kits. So in the beginning, we planned to have many volunteers across the major cities of India. But uh, uh, at the very uh, start of the initiative, it was only me and Varun. So uh, I, I stay in Khargar, Navi, Mumbai. And uh, initially, I thought it would be very difficult to uh, effectively distribute the food packets. But the Khargar Police Department was very instrumental. They escorted us to the areas which were in uh, the most need. And they uh, made sure that there was orderly distribution of food. And uh, without their help, it would have been uh, very difficult to uh, do our uh, jobs and distribute the food packets accordingly. So for the first three days, uh, three to four days, we distributed uh, cooked food packets all around our areas uh, as Slok in Khargar and uh, myself in Chennai. So then we started receiving special requests from transgender community and slum clearing for people to help them with uh, groceries and as well as with cooked food. So that is when we swung into action and uh, distributed aid to them. Also, we facilitated two uh, big missions where we had Mission Odisha, which uh, was to help the uh, people affected due to Amphan cyclone in coastal Odisha and then uh, to help migrant laborers struck, struck in Maharashtra with the help of Maharogi Seva Samiti of Dr. Baba uh, Prakash Amte. And uh, this is how our initiative came to an end. So after the end of the Shubhashish initiative for food delivery, uh, we started Shubhashish Vidya. Uh, which is very, which is where we facilitate peer tutoring in times of lockdown. Uh, it is basically for hobby and skill training, and people who are interested can contact us uh, to contribute. So, as you can see, uh, this is the contact us page on top of our website. You can contact us anytime and uh, inquire about whatever your requirements are. So, till then, Sarvadata Sukhi Bhav. Great. Uh, now I have the pleasure of welcoming Vivek Maru. Uh, Vivek, uh, quick intro. Uh, Vivek is a pioneering social entrepreneur. He is the founder of Namati, a global movement for legal empowerment powered by cadres of grassroots legal advocates. He also convinced a global network of practitioners to foster greater collaboration and ultimately a stronger movement. Prior to launching Namati, uh, Vivek co-founded Timap for Justice, which has been recognized as a pioneering model for delivering justice services in the context of a weak state and a plural legal system. He's also served as the senior counsel in the justice reform of the World Bank and writes like regularly in academic journals and in the press. Vivek uh, will share how community paralegals around the world are equipping people directly affected by environmental destruction to exercise their rights and offer lessons about law, power and institutions that emerge from this legal empowerment work. Vivek, pleasure to have you with us. Uh, over to you for the next 30 minutes. Thank you, Santosh. And awesome to see that short video of, of uh, young people acting in a public spirited way in this perilous moment that we are in. It is an honor to be with you guys on Independence Day. Namaste. I want to talk about environmental justice, as, as Santosh said. And this is a topic that I think about every day. Sometimes it finds me in my dreams. I wanted to start with a, just a little quiz. So you could go to the next slide. My friend Dallin is helping me. Here's a question for everyone. At the current rate, what proportion of the Earth's species will go extinct by the end of this century? Is it 10, 50, 20, 35%? You, please do, if you're on Zoom, go ahead and put your answers in the chat and we will be able to see them. Um, go ahead, Dallin, and, and, and reveal the truth. It's 50%. We're, we're expecting to lose 50% of all species by 2100. Okay, next question. How many people today around the world live with air that the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, considers harmful to human health? If, you, um, if you're on Zoom, please do 
put answers in the chat. Go ahead down and reveal the, the correct one. 91%, 91% of people around the world, according to WHO, are living with unhealthy air. Okay, last question. Yale University takes data from, from 180 countries around the world and it ranks those countries in an environmental performance index. Where do you think India falls on that list? Is it the 14th, the 73rd? Where does it fall? Take a guess. Okay, down, show us what the, what the reality is. 168, almost near the bottom of that list. Next slide. Should we be worried about this situation? I believe we should all be extremely worried, every one of us. On the other hand, should we despair? I, I don't think that is an option. I always remember the words of Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was one of the leaders that, that took South Africa from a situation of apartheid through to freedom and he has lived through hell and something he likes to say is that I'm not an optimist, but I'm a prisoner of hope. And I wanna to describe today some people who have been on a journey from despair to hope. Can anybody guess what this is? If, if, you're, if you're on Zoom, um, put down in the chat what, what you could imagine we are looking at right now. I don't see any guesses yet. Um, this is a bauxite processing facility. That is what you see in the background. Um, so bauxite is mined elsewhere and then brought to this place to be crushed into fine particles and then shipped on the sea. And this is actually in Gujarat, which is where my own family comes from on the coast. And as you can see, the, 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 the bauxite itself is completely uncovered and there is only this small lane that separates that facility from a village. Uh, next slide, Dallin. I, I met these ladies um, in that village and we are standing here on top of that very terrace. I have I've blocked out their eyes just to protect them. And they said to me that living next to that facility was like living in hell. They, they, they explained, Kusum Ben was one of them, she explained that she would do the laundry and put it to dry. And before the laundry was dry, it would be covered in that red bauxite dust. Or she would prepare food for her kids. And by the time the food was ready for the kids to eat, it would be covered in, 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 in bauxite. And there's a doctor about an hour from this place who saw a dozen children with kidney stones from this one small village, which is not normal. Children should not be getting kidney stones. They said, this thing is making us sick. And people were afraid to do anything about it because the contractor who runs that facility is in, as a state MLA and very powerful person, very ruthless person. And people were basically afraid to do anything. But one day, one of those ladies who, was a, who, who sells groceries in that lane, she just got completely fed up. And she, she went out there to beg those young guys to, who were running the machines to slow things down and reduce the dust that was coming across the lane. And almost to spite her for, for, for having the courage to say that, the, the young men started picking up the dust and pounding it on the ground even harder so that it was exploding in her face. And she told me that when that happened, she, she lost it. Some, something in her mind snapped. And she went back to the village, found those other three women and about a dozen others. And they came out to the facility and they picked up stones and they threw the stones at those machines. And actually, the, they, they said the young guys, they just, when, when the ladies started throwing the stones, the young guys picked up their chapal and, 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 and ran away. And the facility got shut down um, for a couple weeks. Uh, but after that, it started up again, just the same as it had before. So what, what are these women supposed to do? India does have strong environmental regulations on the books, but these ladies have never heard of those laws and they have no idea about how to go about enforcing them. And they are not alone down. If you go to the next slide, this is data from the Comptroller Auditor General, which did a, sorry, one more, um, one more. Yeah, there it is. Um, 
which did an analysis of compliance rates in India with various environmental conditions. And the CAG found that compliance rate, non-compliance rates were as high as 57%, meaning we've got rules on the books, but they're not being followed. And that means tribal people living in the shadow of iron ore mines, fisher people whose waters are being poisoned by manufacturing facilities, slum dwellers who are breathing the worst of a city's air, everyone, every, everyone is affected by this, this enforcement gap in environmental law. And I wanna emphasize, and Dallin, if you could actually back up, <clears throat> I wanna emphasize, this is not just, one more, one more. This is not just a problem of India. I, I, my family's from Gujarat, but I grew up in the United States and um, the, the organization that I started, which is called Namati, we work here in the US as well, which is where I'm calling from. And if anyone can guess, I'm gonna look at the chat, what this picture is. This is in Baltimore, which is a city about an hour north of Washington, DC, the capital of the United States. And these are open piles of coal that are brought from West Virginia where they are mined and then placed at the harbor in Baltimore and put on ships. And some of this coal actually likely goes to India. Um, and as you can see, it's not that dissimilar of a situation from the one I showed from Gujarat, where there are people living across the street from these open coal piles. And in the, in the foreground of this photo are young kids who are playing basketball right in the shadow of that coal. And these people as well say similar things that, that um, the presence of that coal is making them sick. So I, I want to emphasize that this is, this is a universal problem. Environmental injustice is everywhere. And I think it's crucial that we recognize that universality and that we work in solidarity to tackle it even while many of our governments are turning inward. So the group I work with, which is called Namathi, we focus on legal empowerment, which is about demystifying law, making it simple, giving ordinary people the ability to use it themselves. And to do that, you need to go beyond lawyers. I, I am a lawyer myself. And um, some of my best friends are lawyers, but, but we have been part of the problem. We have contributed to a culture of law that is elite and inaccessible. And so in particular, at Namathi, we have focused on what we call community paralegals. Sometimes we're called barefoot lawyers who can create a bridge between the formal promises of law on the one hand and real life on the other hand. And what paralegals do is they demystify law. They try to make it simple and they equip ordinary people to use it themselves. And so if you could show Dallin, I, I have a picture of one of our community paralegals who these ladies met. And he, he knew that there, were, uh, there was problems with this facility, but it, no one was willing to do anything about it. it. When he heard about this incident where the ladies threw the stones and the, and the place got shut down for a couple of weeks, he went and found those ladies. And he said, I am so admiring that you had the courage to do something about this. And I am sorry that the results that you got were not, were, 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 were temporary. But if you are game, I have another road we can follow. And that is the road of law. We could make use of the law. And the, the lady said they were game. Um, and the first thing that he did is show them the clearance letter, which is something issued by the state government, uh, the Pollution Control Board um, of the state government. And it says that the facility can operate, but it has to comply with specific conditions. And that, that letter is in English, but these folks don't speak English. And they had never, never seen that letter. They, they'd been living for many, many years in the shadow of this facility, but they had never seen the conditions under which that facility was bound. And so the community paralegal who, 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 who's here he explained what some of those conditions were. And immediately the ladies could tell that there was a difference between what was on paper and what was happening in practice. So they used that information to put in a small application. They didn't go to a lawyer. It didn't go in the paralegal's name. It went in the ladies' names themselves. And they put an application saying, we have seen the conditions. We have evidence of non-compliance. We are asking you to come, come and take a look. And when they did that, initially nothing happened, but they went and followed up at the office. And eventually um, they were able to get someone to come and pay a visit. And indeed, when the inspector came, he recognized that there were gross violations. Um, and he issued an order saying, a show cause notice saying to the company, why is it that you are not complying with these regulations? 
I mentioned before that the comp the the head of that company is a contr is a uh, MLA, and so he basically ignored that that notice. He didn't do anything about it. But the ladies did not give up. They ended up traveling all the way to the state capital, Gandhi Nagar and um, making an appeal in person and saying, look, your own official, your own officer has issued this notice, but the company's continuing to ignore it. And um, we, 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 we are just asking that the rules on the books be enforced. And so from the state capital, they actually issued a closure notice um, ordering the company to stop its operations until it came in compliance with the rules. And the rules actually require the company to be able to go down so all of that uh, bauxite is processed uh, indoors rather than just being open and spraying on this, this village. And so down, if you could show everybody, I went back a year later, this is the same terrace. I'm saying on the, standing on the same terrace and you can see the difference, the place got shut down. Go back a couple slides down just to remind folks of the contrast of what it looked like when the facility was operating. There it is. Uh, and then same terrace a few slides later, um, a year later, and 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 the uh, the women said to me, "We can now do our laundry and the clothes aren't red. We can feed our children food and there's not this bauxite masala on top, and we can breathe again. We can breathe again. We weren't able to breathe before. We can breathe again. And perhaps even more important than that, there was a shift in attitude." One of the ladies said to me, I now know there is law on my side. And they felt less afraid, less afraid to take action, less afraid of the MLA who ran the company next door. They felt greater power among themselves. And that, that is the transformation we are looking for with legal empowerment. Um, let, let, let's show the next slide, Dallin. Yeah, they, they kind of went on a legal empowerment journey where it started as an impact, which is a, something that was hurting them. And then once they understood more about law, they could reconceive of that impact as a violation, something that was breaking rules that belonged to them. And then they use that knowledge of the law to pursue a solution, a remedy. And so that's the sort of journey that we are aiming to foster everywhere. Uh, next slide, Dallin. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you, you know, I mentioned that we work with community legal workers in India, but also here in the States. And, this is Terrell Askew, who's a friend of mine and a community legal worker from Baltimore. Um, and I just took his picture in front of that coal pile. And he is working with communities there, inspired by that work in Gujarat, following a very similar process, helping folks to understand what the rules say and navigating the administrative solution, administrative institutions to try to get a solution. Um, next slide, Dallin. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I wanted to say that this process of legal empowerment doesn't just happen one problem at a time or one case at a time. This is really a pathway towards improving the systems and the rules themselves. And what we have found is across many cases, that experience teaches us how a system is working in practice. And when people come together across their many cases, they can identify patterns and ways in which the rules that we have now are insufficient. And they can use the experience of those cases to argue for improvements to rules and systems. Um, in, in India, that, that, this legal empowerment cycle from casework um, building towards systemic change has le led to improvements in sand mining regulations, improvements to the way uh, the coastal zone regulation is enforced in, in Karnataka. Um, and there are paralegals and communities that we work with across four states, as well as many others uh, working with other groups around the country who have managed to, to turn this wheel. I should say that the experience from casework is also useful in resisting harmful dilutions to environmental law, including some that are happening as we speak. For example, the um, EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment Notification, as many of you know, is up for revision this year and risks being diluted significantly. And the casework of ordinary people trying to make the rules work is valuable in uh, trying to make the case that those rules should not be diluted. Um, so in, in closing, I would like to say, um, and down if you could come back to the next slide, that legal empowerment is something that everybody can do, all of us can do this in our own community. You can be a paralegal, just like the two gentlemen I showed you in your own life. And here's what you need to do, it's very simple. 
look for environmental harms. They're not hard to find if you look. Pollution of water, or of air, of land, or on the flip side, environmental opportunities. If there's a degraded landscape near you that could be reforested, for example, that's step one. Step two, find out what the rules say. Oh, sorry, get, get, get to know the people most affected. That is crucial. Just like the paralegal I showed you, you got to know those ladies who are living next door. Reach out, just like those young men in the video that we saw earlier, reach out, get to know the people most affected. Thirdly, find out what the rules say, find out what the clearance letter says, find out what, what the rules on the books are, and then try to use those rules to pursue a solution. Next slide. And drawing on that experience, wh whether you win or you lose, come together with others to advocate for better rules. Because if every one of us engages, you can go to the next slide down, if, if every single one of us comes to know law, use law, and shape law, then we will build, be building a deeper version of democracy, one in which we can put the planet and ourselves, people above profits. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna close with. I did wanna share a few resources on how you can do this work in your own community. The one on the left is a, is a guide for how community paralegals can work for environmental justice. And again, er, anyone can be a community paralegal. The second one breaks down specific provisions in, in Indian environmental law and shows how each of them can be used to solve a concrete problem. So it makes the rules simple and it gives you examples of how you can use those rules. And the third one is a global community of people who are pursuing this, this passion of legal empowerment. And I invite all of you to join it. Um, so we got a few minutes left and if folks are on the phone, I would love to um, address any questions or have a discussion. I do see one here, let's see. The machines, the implementation standards of the regulations are flouted right when they are being implemented. Those who come to check also pass a bland eye. I cannot for the life of me understand why the industry owners believe how they can get, scot get off scot-free. Even if the law doesn't punish them, the environment will. Someday the environment will punish them. Yeah, but we should wait until the environment punishes them. I think those rules belong to all of us. And so the, the spirit of legal empowerment is um, that it is by ordinary people learning those rules, invoking those rules, that we can ensure that they come to life. Um, someone has asked about the EIA 2020, um, and it looks like we've got a couple others in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, 2020. I, I am I am worried, and I actually would would point out that there's a there's a really disturbing parallel here in the United States. We have something called NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it is the equivalent of the EIA notification in India. It sets out the basic framework by which we can make decisions about industrial projects that pose some risk to environment, and very concerningly, during the pandemic. The U.S. government went ahead with with really damaging dilutions to that law, despite thousands and thousands of public comments asking for the contrary. And I I fear that the same thing is happening in India. And so I, I would just underscore um, this reality that these problems of environmental justice, of um, failure to enforce the rules we have, and then dilution of those rules. These problems are, are, are taking place in many places, if not everywhere. And it is crucial that ordinary people like, like the ones on the phone right now connect and work in solidarity to make the best use of the rules we have and work towards improvements of those rules and, and defense of those rules when, when we do have them. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's my plug for global solidarity from a from an um, American-born Desi across the ocean facing very similar issues here in the States as the ones that I see in my, my native place of, of Gujarat and elsewhere in India. Um, let's see, you've got a few others. I'm scrolling up. We have one in the Q&A box, uh, Vivek, if there's any okay. To show that the environmental degradation accelerates uh, human depreciation and shortens lifespan for both rich and poor in unsustainable economies. Is there any research linking 
the two. Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes. There's there's um, very clear research. Um, there was a recent study that showed that air pollution is one of the most significant causes of premature death in India. Um, and so, yeah, these aren't abstract concerns. Um, it's not exclusively about the wildlife, though it is about wildlife. It's about our own health. And um, these, the, these, our failure to steward um, our environment and the impunity with which industries pollute is, is making us sick and, and making us die. And actually the, the pandemic has really brought that out in stark relief. Um, Harvard University just published a study looking at the United States and they found that <clears throat> communities who are subject to greater air pollution are dying disproportionately of the coronavirus. And so um, it is one of the things that makes people more vulnerable to this, to this specific disease. Yeah, and we have another uh, question Please. on financial systems. So financial systems do not account for the cost of production of natural resources. Doesn't this global subsidy allow all of us to shortchange indigenous communities who own these resources? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love that question. I think we've got things backwards right now. And I, I think we need to move out of an old paradigm. I would say sort of 20th century thinking was, well, we're going to have to compromise the environment in order to develop, you know, you can't have both. And so we need to pollute some, you know, destroy, destroy some rivers and, and, and emit some dirty things in order for us to develop. And, and it's, you can't, you can't have both. So we need to choose and let's choose development. I think that's 20th century thinking. I think now in the 21st century with the reality of climate change and the finiteness of the resources that we all depend on, it has never been more clear that that is a false choice and that we shouldn't be uh, thinking of ourselves as having to choose between environment or development, but rather we should be opting for a form of development that is consistent with air we can breathe, water we can drink, um, and, and uh, stewardship of the lands we depend on. We, we, we need to be able to choose both of those things and that, that should shape the kind of development that we pursue. And uh, we have another one here uh, uh, as to what kind of challenges have you found paralegals face while working in the mm. communities? Uh, what are the skill sets that are required? Mm. Great question. Great question. Um, well, you saw that I had put the put the um, the black stripes on their eyes. And, you know, the, the reality is that um, there are great power imbalances all over the world, and. Um, standing up for environment oftentimes attracts some form of retaliation. And so um, one of the things that paralegals face is that, is that risk. And I think the more of us who take part in this work, um, the more normal it will become. Uh, and, and the more young people, the more students, the more professionals who work as paralegals in their own lives, um, the, the, the more we can defend and protect the ones who are most most vulnerable. So that, that, that is one set of challenges. And I think we can all be part of the solution to that one. Um, <clears throat> there's also just a degree of complexity and um, sort of technical heaviness of environmental law. It's not simple. It's written in a way almost designed for people not to understand it. And so it does take time to try to comprehend it, break it down and simplify it. And I think the, again, the, the more ordinary people take that effort to use the rules as they are now, the more we can also identify where the rules are overly complex and use our experience to argue for simplifications of those rules. So there too, I think, um, I think that uh, participation from everyone in this crucial system that we all depend on can work to, to make the system better and to address that challenge. Yeah, we have a couple of more uh, coming in. Uh, how about relocation? Will re is relocation a win-win or uh, mm. how do you see uh, relocation in the context? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and it's live in India and around the world. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important to remember about the Indian uh, legal framework is the Forest Rights Act. Um, which for scheduled tribes allows people to 
say no to relocation. Uh, the, the, the term um, in international law is free prior informed consent. And the Forest Rights Act of 1996, it guarantees uh, forest dwelling tribal communities the ability to have their, to, to exercise their free prior informed consent. And I, government, the, the Indian government has recently announced <clears throat> um, a number of new coal blocks that they are planning to put up for auction. And I just think it's important for all of us to remind um, the government of that provision in the Forest Rights Act that ultimately these communities have the right to choose whether they want that mining to take place on their land or not. And if if a Gram Sabha, meaning a, a local public assembly, decides that they do not want it, then um, then we all have to abide by that decision. That's what free prior informed consent means. So I think the right not to be displaced is a really crucial one. And in Indian law, it is provided, at least to some people, um, outside of that specific context of, of tribal communities who are covered under the Forced Rights Act. Um, I would not go so far to say that we, 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 we would never be able to justly um, uh, move people because there are um, sometimes absolutely critical public infrastructure projects, um, or maybe even to preserve some of the environment, you, you know, in order to have like, let's say an elephant corridor or a, um, a, an integrous uh, uh, a wildlife corridor, you may, have, you, you may have to move people. But I think historically, when we have done that, um, societies and governments have badly, badly failed the basic human rights protections uh, that, that should go along with that. Because when you take somebody, someone out of their home, you are doing something really monumental. Um, and so you have to, the, the only way we can do that justly, if those people are, receive um, tru truly um, reasonable and dignified uh, terms. And, and, and that means accommodations, it means a, a place where they can live and where, where they can make a living um, and where they have control over what their new reality looks like. And we have time and time again, failed to do that in, in a reasonable way. And that's not just in India, that is all over the world, including here in the United States where I'm sitting. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, Vivek, I think we are almost out of time. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of uh, questions pouring in a lot more gratitude than questions mm. also. Mm. But uh, yeah, any uh, last parting message given the, you know, the questions that you've seen now? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate people waking up at 6.30 in the morning to tune in. And um, it's Independence Day. I mean, I, I think um, India is one of the world's great democracies, <clears throat> but that democracy, like many democracies today, is under threat. And in order for us to escape this environmental crisis that we are in, we're gonna need to deepen that democracy. And I, I invite all of you to be a part of that. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Vivek, uh, for your remarkable work and illuminating perspective. Thanks for joining us. Take care, everyone. Happy Independence Day. Peace. Great. Uh, next up, we have a panel discussion on how networks can drive more capital towards impact in India. To get this started, I'm delighted to invite uh, Naina Batra. Naina is Chairperson and CEO of Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. Prior to joining AVPN, uh, Naina was a senior leader at the Monitor Group. She was also a partner and co-founder of Group 50. In 2019, Naina was awarded one of Asia's top sustainability superwomen. Naina, wonderful to have you and over to you for the next 30 minutes. Thank you, Santosh. Um, namaste and good morning from Singapore. Um, I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much to the Nudge Forum for inviting us. According to a report released by the Indian Impact Investors Council um, earlier on this year, impact enterprises in India have collectively raised $10.8 billion over the last decade. This has been invested into more than 550 for-profit social enterprises that in turn have impacted more than 490 million beneficiaries who are mostly low-income communities that are underserved by traditional businesses, as well as through public sector social service delivery. While we may argue that this is a relatively small amount of capital, these impact investments have had an outsized effect on India's socio-economic development, 
because of the direct targeting of underserved customers and the high level of business and technology innovation that has been seeded and scaled by impact investors to address the most important development challenges that are facing our nation. As impact investing is comparatively nascent in India, I do believe, and this is not coming from any place of bias, that networks have played a big role in promoting awareness and building a community of impact. As, as Santosh mentioned, I'm Nena Sabarwal Batra. I am the CEO of AVPN, which is the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, Asia's largest social investing network that brings together foundations, corporates, impact investors, VCs, and family offices from more than 36 countries to deploy capital towards impact across Asia. I have great pleasure in welcoming to this fireside chat along with me, my close friend, Amit Bori, the CEO of the Global Impact Investing Network or the GIN from New York, and Sudhir Sethi, the chairman of Chirate Ventures, one of the largest VC firms in India. Amit and Sudhir, welcome to this discussion. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting and actually very relevant to have both of you because you represent um, both network and investor. And I think um, you're gonna help us over the next 30 minutes to understand the growth of this sector in India and why it is so important as India needs to go towards achieving the social, the sustainable development goals. So first, Amit, a few words about yourself and about the gin. Yeah, sure. No, thank you. And um, I'm such, um, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. And it's, it's late in the evening here in New York. And I know many of you are dialing in very early in the morning. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm incredibly I'm grateful for this opportunity. I think it's such an important um, discussion to be having, of course, on such a special holiday and happy Independence Day to everyone. Um, so I am um, you know, was born in the United States um, and um, have been working to help um, you know, develop the impact investing market for a, about 12 years now. The GIN was founded in 2009 um, with a mandate to help um, really be a global champion of impact investing all around the world. And one of the things that we do, of course, is we are a network of investors, as our name would suggest. Um, and we include um, over 300 uh, formal members um, based in about 50 countries around the world um, and over 30,000 um, or, or, um, people who are part of our network globally. Um, now, those organizations are huge financial institutions, um, you know, some of the world's largest global institutions, all the way down to boutique firms, in places like India, Bangladesh, Kenya, um, the United States, the Netherlands, and so on. Um, but what unites all of our members uh, is the conviction that they can use investment capital to have a positive impact on people in the planet. Um, and they focus on a broad range of, of sectors. So things like financial inclusion, sustainable agriculture, clean energy access, uh, increasing access to healthcare for low-income populations. Um, and um, we do a lot of work at the gym uh, to help drive research on what's happening in the market and also to help provide tools and resources for how you can measure and manage your impact. Thanks, Amit. Um, and over to you, Sudhir. Just a few words about yourself and about Chirate as well. Uh, thank you, Naina and uh, Amit uh, for having me here. Uh, and again, happy Independence Day to you and the audiences. Um, we are a venture fund. We believe uh, uh, impact and financial investing uh, in the outsized returns manner are two sides of the coin. We manage about $800 million worth of uh, capital. Uh, we invested in uh, 97, uh, com 87 companies so far, exited 40, um, and more when we talk. Thanks, Sudhir. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Amit. You know, we are here, uh, you and I, both of us represent networks. And I think uh, you know, networks do a lot which is uh, sometimes not understood in terms of, you know, just bringing people together in terms of advocacy, in terms of learning. So what role do you see um, a global network like GIN playing in expanding the capital that is targeted towards impact here in South Asia? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, um, you know, there, we were very intentional about setting up a network when we were founded. And it was based on a premise that if we were trying to change the way that people thought of investment um, and trying to increase the amount of capital that was focused on having an impact while achieving a financial return, um, we needed to teach many investors um, to, a new way of doing their jobs um, and support many institutions who are very pioneering and in trying to innovate on models of investing all around the world. 
um, to help have a, gl a global support in a community um, so they can help accelerate their own learning. A big premise for us is collective learning. Um, that there are people, you know, of course, in, in India, um, in, in the Netherlands, in Brazil, and the United States, um, you know, in um, Southeast Asia, who are all trying to advance um, different models of scaling businesses that have a positive impact and are financially sustainable and viable. Um, and so we don't want the wheel to be reinvented all over the world at the same time. Um, we want to help make sure that um, people are making um, new mistakes, not repeating old ones, and are really able to take advantage of the best thinking and best innovation in the world. Um, so we very much think if you can visualize a network of nodes of activity, uh, nodes of light all around the world, making sure that they're connected and across those networks that information, capital, and ideas flow um, as fast as possible. Um, and as you started um, Nina, you know, with the focus on the sustainable development goals, if we are to achieve those important goals, um, we need to move a lot more capital much faster and have it make sure it's incredibly effective, effective at achieving an impact. Um, so I see networks as essential to accelerating our progress. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, you made a couple of really important points here, you know, in terms of highlighting to investors that there is a new way of investing, that they need to look at embracing a new way of investing, that there are different models of scaling. And you know, I I, I love the the um, you know allegory of of the nodes of positive impact all over the world that we can all that we can all um, tap into. I'm going to bring Sudhir into the discussion as well right now. You know, Sudhir, you and I talked about it, and uh, we've talked about you as a mainstream investor. You have you have looked at investment in a different way. So you know, sort of building on Amit's point. Do you, do you feel that you've had to look at a new way of investing as you have uh, kind of you know, looked at measuring the impact that your investments have created? How would you sort of uh, describe um, in terms of uh, impact investing or investing that Chirate has done? Um, you know, how would you describe the impact that it has created? So <clears throat> I think first and foremost, I really believe that, uh, and I, I must say that the impact side of this was not there for the first five years of our life or six years of our life. We were investing for outsized returns. And that was in consumer, in software, in fintech. And then we realized that, look, if you really look at it, each of those companies are solving a real problem. And our investment thesis became backing, obviously, great entrepreneurs who are solving problems in India which have not been solved before. I think that's a very fundamental issue. And we are still a financial investor. And those problems we believe can only be solved by using technology. I think this is the key theme to us, whether it is in supply chain, whether it is in distribution chains, whether it is addressing uh, crop productivity, whether it is addressing you know, uh, e-commerce. I mean, e-commerce when we invested in Mintra was fashion, but then we discovered that it's about delivering the right product at the right price with the right quality, with the right predictable delivery time and that to me is impact because that was not available. Uh, you can define from a narrow point of view that, that that is not impact. Having a product delivered at the right time with high quality at the right price with predictability is to me a service which a consumer wants. Now, if you look at the way we are looking at uh, impact, uh, we, are, we started measuring impact. That had an enormously catalytic effect on us and our LPs. And our, it was a motivational issue. Today, um, AgroStar started as um, an e-commerce for agriculture. But today, they are delivering crop productivity solutions to farmers. Okay, The market, tens of billions of dollars in India. Uh, and incidentally, it's all using technology. Uh, if you look at a company like... Uh, uh, lens card. Now I'm, I'm taking commercial examples to give you the impact. Um, they pre COVID and you know, they're almost there back now again, they were delivering 15,000 eyeglasses per day. And the bulk of them was for eye correction, vision correction, right? Which basically is driving the technological output and, and they are now taking it global. If you look at first cry as an example, started out as e-commerce, but now moving rapidly into 
how to deliver baby care to three lakh mothers per month. That's what they address. So effectively, I think it's having a change on the strategy of companies by looking at the way, if you look at e-commerce, that's fine. But if you look at having, having access to babies, which are three lakh deliveries a month, your mind changes and that's a new business opportunity which comes up uh, overall. Uh, if you look at Aether as an example, Aether is delivering uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence based, robotics based prosthetics at a price point which no other company in the world can deliver. And that we are seeing as a big market. So I think the way we are looking at it, and I can take these examples, you know, uh, as many as you want, there are two sides of the coin. I think the big difference is that we used to address as a, as a financial investor, the top 100 million consumers, if I take consumer as a market for financial inclusion, I won't say financial inclusion, I, I'm cautious of using those words, financial impact, okay, to deliver debt uh, to SMEs, uh, let's say to the top 100 million consumers, to the top, uh, you know, a few million SMEs and so on and so forth. Now, our strategy is that those same companies or new companies can scale massively by going to the next 400 million consumers. The difference I see from an impact viewpoint, a traditional impact viewpoint is, traditional impact must to start at the bottom of the pyramid, we start at the top and the meeting point is coming in now, okay? And that is a very, very important. I think impact is just the other side of the coin of companies, entrepreneurial companies using technology to solve a real problem. And that's what we're doing. There is no compromise on financial returns. You said a lot of very, very interesting things and a few provocative things as well in, in your statement. So I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to raise a few of these. Um, you started out by talking about, you know, you, you, you started measuring impact and that had a big, um, big sort of um, impact, if I want to call it that, on, on your LP. Um, I, I want to know a little bit more about how you started measuring impact. You also then talked about the fact that, you know, initially for the first few years, the focus was on financial returns and then kind of, you know, sort of almost uh, sort of retrospectively, you went to see the impact that was created. And the third thing, which I think is, is huge, is that a lot of the entrepreneurs or the businesses that you invested in actually saw scale by, by you know, expanding their product or expanding their market to include the underserved communities or communities uh, that they hadn't thought of earlier. And finally, I thought what was very interesting is, you know, you said you started from the top end of the market and you kind of moved towards uh, the, the middle. And, you know, you have people who invest traditionally uh, in social enterprises and they were kind of moving towards the middle of the market as well. And, and that's where the two met and there is no, uh, there's no discounted returns. You're, you're both creating impact, but in your mind, very, very clearly, there are no discounted returns. I think all of this is music to Amit's ears as well. Uh, you know, impact and no discounted financial returns. So I'm going to bring both of you into this conversation. Let's start with the impact measurement first, because there are a bunch of questions that have also come in around impact measurement. So Sudhir, first from you, um, what have you been using for, for impact measurement? And then to Amit, because I'm, I'm very impressed with, you know, Iris Plus, what Jin has launched and what Jin has uh, rolled out. I'd love then Amit to bring Iris Plus into the discussion as well. So uh, uh, Sudhir, first to you, what, what have you been doing to sort of measure impact and how do you communicate that to your LPs? So I think first, first phase for us, um, we actually had... Uh, an experienced uh, person, uh, her name is Vidya. She joined us uh, about uh, eight months back. Before that, we actually were talking to DFIs. We were talking to some Indian investors and that's very important. You know, we raise capital from India and outside India, okay? 50% of our capital comes from India and Indian investors started asking us that, uh, are you solving any real problems? And as, as a result of which we said, okay, yes, we are. And DFI said, are you creating employment? We started measuring employment, okay? And we suddenly found that um, at the end of the day, uh, there were 50,000 uh, jobs which were created. And this was quite some time back by the companies which were there and tertiary job or, or connected jobs was a ratio of one is to three. And that was being asked by DFIs. That was being asked by SIDBI, one of our uh, uh, investors in India, which is like a sovereign fund of fund. 
And they said, okay, if you're doing that, then can you prove it to us? Said, okay, we went out back to our companies and said, count, count, count. Um, we, uh, we went and said, uh, okay, let's count, uh, you, know, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, productivity increase for farmers, right? Because that was a big issue as far as farmers were concerned. We started going back to truck drivers of Blowhorn and saying, is there an increase in your income? Now, this is not something which is non-financial returns because this is the financial outcome of a good company delivering its product and services in a proper way. So when we started doing that, a couple of things happened. One, and this is important for a VC, we got more capital. We raised, you know, in the last uh, couple of years, about $100 million worth of additional capital. Now that obviously is very motivating. And we also realized that I think if, if traditional impact investors, which is what we are doing right now, are coming from the bottom end, you know, and staying at the bottom and coming a little bit to the middle, uh, they may actually miss out on the 400, 500 million people. It's a missed opportunity if that horizon does not expand. We went back to our entrepreneurs and said, can we start measuring it? Can we do this quarterly? We have an MIS which comes monthly and quarterly, which is financial return. We added this as part of our standard MIS, which comes to us. And it had enormous effect because LP started receiving that. LP started talking to us on that. LP started helping us in that. We, st we Our uh, team got phenomenally motivated because we were coming to office every day in the morning saying money, 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 and saying, oh, okay, there is crop productivity. There is, uh, you know, uh, mothers being tackled. There is, uh, so our health tech strategy emerged very nicely. Do realize there are a billion people in India out of which only 50 million people have health cover. How do you get health to a billion people? We started thinking differently. How, you cannot have enough resources. I mean, to, to build a baby care center, it, take, it takes 25 crore rupees, right? Which means if you have to address 3 lakh mothers every month act, or more, right? You need thousands of babies. India doesn't have that capital. So government doesn't have that capital. There are students today who, have, who are not able to study, right? And we are finding that digital divide is very powerful. So we are looking for a company not to deliver on the computer or on the cell phone. We're looking for a company who can deliver on television. So please understand, our mind has changed. Television, there are 200 million families who have television in the country, but not a single education program runs on that. And I find enormous amount of discussion on digital divide and how education has to be delivered. But here we have infrastructure across the country Nobody needs to buy computers. How can we deliver? Is there a company which we can look at which can deliver television-based education learning programs? Because then today 90% of the students are not able to study sitting at home. Please understand that, right? Absolutely. Is this a financial? Uh, this answer is yes. So I think our thinking has changed completely by looking for companies which are very different and solving enormous giant scaled problems which have not been solved before using technology. Build them into big brands in the country and then in fact, take them global. So please understand, a company which is solving a problem in India, that problem can be taken outside the country. So half our companies are now global footprint. That's an amazing scale. Thanks, Sudhir. I'm going to actually bring Amit in now. So Amit, you know, obviously, you know, Sudhir said, which I thought was very interesting, is that by measuring other than the financial returns, by looking at the impact that they were creating, not only did more money come in, not only were their investors happy, but their employees were also happy. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the trends of impact measurement and how is that helping us drive more capital towards impact? Absolutely, thank you. And, and thank you for those comments there. And, and I think, you know, a couple of things that I'd highlight, you know, we at the gin, we see impact measurement and management as fundamental to good impact investing. Um, and when I mean measurement and management, um, obviously measuring is gathering the data and understanding how you're doing, but management is incorporating that data into how you manage your funds and how you manage your companies. Um, and, and I think that's where you know, data really informs decision-making. Um, we um, you know, provide resources to the market and, the, and in particular, you know, we have, offer a system called IRIS Plus. It's I-R-I-S with a plus sign. It's a free online comprehensive system for measuring and managing your impact. 
Um, so you can start with a sustainable development goal or a specific thematic area. It could be gender equality, it could be clean and affordable energy, and identify the core metric sets backed up by evidence that you can use to measure your progress. Now, where I think this is really important, the trends we're seeing um, in the early days of the gym, um, when we were founded, um, it was a lot of kind of what I would call do-gooder organizations focused on measurements. Um, foundations, government-backed institutions, nonprofit investors, um, who are all doing really interesting work. Now, if you're talking to a mainstream asset manager or asset owner, um, they're asking um, you know, for you know, how we can, they can better understand the impact that they're having. Um, this morning, I spoke to the head of investments for a 200 billion euro um, pension fund. Um, and the main topic um, on his mind was how do we measure impact and better understand the non-financial indicators of performance. And that I think is an incredibly powerful driver of interest. You know, if we have people controlling massive pools of capital who want to not only know how much profit their investments are making, but also understand the impact that they're having on people and the planet, um, that's um, what you'd hope people are using for decision making. And that, of course, um, is the type of thing that leads to what Sudir's experience, where you know, they are, um, that is driving the way some investors are allocating capital. Um, this is a trend where this is becoming more and more prevalent across most of the mainstream asset managers we engage with. Um, so I think anyone you know, who's working on investing now should be paying attention to these trend lines because it's not just in the impact investing market, but it's actually going much more mainstream now. I think we can see that. I mean, you know, so he talked about how he is a, a mainstream VC, a VC investor who obviously was driven by financial returns and has seen the value of actually looking at uh, financial returns plus. So is that, Amit, where you're seeing the growth coming into uh, the impact investment community? Is it more mainstream investors like Sudhir and Chirate Capital that are coming into uh, uh, you know, what we would call the impact investment group? Yeah, we, we are seeing um, you know, growth across the board. So we, we see more philanthropic foundations becoming active in impact investing, uh, more HNIs um, who are, who are um, allocating capital towards impact investing. But increasingly, we're seeing more institutions where much of the world's capital sits. Um, one thing I think is important to highlight, too, in the moment we're in now, you know, where we're dealing with a global pandemic that's you know, unprecedented in modern times, um, you know, I actually see on the on the horizon an even greater emphasis uh, on impact. Um, you know, coming down the line, um, as we turn the world's attention turns to how we drive a more sustainable recovery, um, because I think we've now seen a lot of the inequities in the world really highlighted by the COVID crisis. Um, to things we've always known that were there, but vast differences in how people are treated along the supply chain, the nature of you know the haves and have-nots, and how they experience a crisis like this healthcare access, safe work environments. Um, and I expect most investors will be much more attentive to the role their capital is playing in either helping to reduce inequality or helping to reinforce it. Um, and I think that will be a huge driver in interest and uh, in impact and impact measurement uh, throughout the investment landscape. No, absolutely, Amit. And I, I think, you know, COVID has had a lot of impact on, on very, th very many, many things, including you know, possibly um, taking us further back from achieving the SDGs. And, you know, absolutely, as you said, uh, it is also creating more awareness about the impact that capital needs to and has to create. So here, I'm going to ask you, bring you in right now. When you and I were talking before, you know, you said something really interesting. And I'd love for you to share that with the, with the audience in terms of how COVID has impacted your investments. Because I think uh, that is, that to me was an eye opener and the fact that, you know, these investments seem to be uh, very robust despite uh, the challenges. So, so Sudhir, could you share a little bit of what you shared with me in terms of the impact COVID has had on your portfolio? Yes, uh, and a great point. And we were very pleasantly uh, surprised at the pace. So just to give you a feel, in the month of March, uh, we have about 55 active companies. The total annualized revenue of our companies and all technology driven uh, was about a billion dollars, 7,000 crores. In the month of, I'm sorry, behind me, there is Independence Day music being played. So I'm sorry, I can't uh, stop that. <laughs> and um, so effectively, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So effectively, in the month of April, we found that that $1 billion of revenue had crashed to $350 million. 
and so in fact you know we got together with the entrepreneurs and i must say that this is my fourth downturn which i'm going through in my vc life and i saw enormous maturity agility entrepreneurs talked about new products new uh, service models new business models new revenue models being pre-pawned added etc in the month of may this revenue went up to 650 million dollars in the month of june it went to 770 million dollars and in july we are back to a billion okay now obviously within those 55 companies some are positive some are negative but what worked was very simple since offline was shut down in the omnichannel model in consumer or in the b2b uh, we found that we had to go digital so live doctor consultations fitness at home uh, you know delivery and a cluster level rather than on consumer so many changes were made that 16 of our companies actually grew faster than pre-COVID times and at a massive scale. So in fact, scale increased because of three things which we did. Di going digital, going online, and then some companies took more steps to go global. Today, eyewear is sold by Lenskart in US. CureFit is in, in, in putting fitness solutions for homes across the world, especially in the US. First try is addressing baby care and mother care needs in Middle East. Um, a small company. We took consumer companies outside the country because they were solving problems bigger outside the country while they were solving problems at a smaller scale. So the scale at which they came back was very surprising, pleasantly surprising. Now those growth patterns have come back faster. Okay, thanks, Sudeep. I'm going to quickly go to Amit. One minute, Amit. What do you think needs is a, is a trend that we need to make sure that continues so that uh, we, we drive impact faster? Well, I think one of the most important things that um, Sudhir spoke to is making sure that we're thinking about um, how we incorporate impact data um, into how we make decisions. Um, because ultimately, you know, what you want as an investor is more information about the performance of your companies. Um, and, and what I think is absolutely critical is that we keep in mind that, you know, there's a purpose for money that's greater than just making more money. Um, and that is that, you know, any, every dollar invested out there is having an impact on things related to the environment, and to social inequality and other issues. Um, and to have that consciousness front and center, but to back it up with hard data about performance that we can use to make better decisions. Thank you, Amit. And you know, it's it's almost, I have 30 seconds to go before we go to the flag hoisting and you know, to celebrate India's 53rd Independence Day. I think I'd like to end with the message that capital has a higher purpose than profit. I think uh, throughout this 24 hours global nudge forum session, we are seeing uh, the highlight of purpose. And I think uh, the COVID pandemic has also shown us that purpose needs to come first. And I think from what Sudhir has said, purpose and profit don't have to be two separate things. They can go together quite, quite well. So thank you very much, Sudhir and Amit, for joining us. And I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone here a very happy Independence Day. And thank you very much to the Nudge Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Naina, Amit, and Sudhir. Uh, we'll quickly switch over to the feed from uh, Redford. And uh, right after that, we have an awesome concert coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you.
लगातार सातवीं बार स्वाधीनता दिवस पर प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी राष्ट्र को संबोधित करेंगे उनके विचारों को सुनने की उत्सुकता सबके मन में है द प्राइम मिनिस्टर एक्नोलॉजिंग द ग्रीटिंग्स ऑफ दोज प्रेजेंट द नेशनल फ्लैग कार्ड ऑन इट्स वे आउट फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द रैम पार्ट एंड इन अ शॉर्ट वाइल फ्रॉम नाउ Prime Minister will address the nation from the historic red fort. This rare living symbol telling its own story. The place where the history of medieval India was crafted and today it is a connect between the past and India's modern present. राष्ट्रीय ध्वजारोहण गारत के सजीले जवान रवाना हो रहे हैं समारोह स्थल से इसमें शामिल थल सेना का प्रतिनिधित्व इस बार किया प्रथम गोरखा राइफल्स ने क्योंकि इस पांचवी बटालियन जिसमें भाग ले रही थी इसकी स्थापना 1942 में धर्मशाला में की गई थी और सभी को प्रतीक्षा प्रधानमंत्री महोदय के उद्बोधन की मेरे प्यारे देशवासियों आजादी के इस पावन पर्व की सभी देशवासियों को बधाई और बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं आज जो हम स्वतंत्र भारत में सांस ले रहे हैं उसके पीछे मां भारती के लाखों बेटे बेटियों उनका त्याग उनका बलिदान और मां भारती को आजाद कराने के संकल्प के प्रति उनका समर्पण आज ऐसे सभी हमारे स्वातंत्र सेनानियों का आजादी के वीरों का नर बांकुरों का वीर शहीदों का नमन करने का ये पर्व है हमारे फौज के जाबाज जवान हमारे अर्धसैनिक बल हमारे पुलिस के जवान सुरक्षा बल से जुड़े हुए हर कोई मां भारती के रक्षा में जुटे रहते हैं सामान्य मानवी की सुरक्षा में जुटे रहते हैं आज उन सबको भी हृदय पूर्वक आदर पूर्वक स्मरण करने का उनके महान त्याग तपस्या को नमन करने का पर्व है एक नाम और श्री अरविंद घोष क्रांति दूत से लेकर आध्यात्म की यात्रा आज उनके संकल्प उनका जन्म जयंती है हमें उनके संकल्पों को हमारे संकल्पों को पूर्ण करने के उनकी तरफ से आशीर्वाद बने रहे हम एक विशिष्ट परिस्थिति से गुजर रहे हैं 
आज छोटे छोटे बालक मेरे सामने नजर नहीं आ रहे भारत का उज्जवल भविष्य क्यों कोरोना ने सबको रोका हुआ है इस कोरोना के कालखंड में लक्षावधि कोरोना वॉरियर्स चाहे डॉक्टर हो नर्सिज हो सफाई कर्मी हो एम्बुलेंस चलाने वाले लोग हो किस किस के नाम गिनाऊंगा उन लोगों ने इतने लंबे समय तक जिस प्रकार से सेवा परमो धर्म इस मंत्र को जी करके दिखाया है पूर्ण समर्पण भाव से मां भारती के लालों की सेवा की है ऐसे सभी कोरोना वॉरियर्स को भी मैं आज नमन करता हूं इस कोरोना के कालखंड में अनेक हमारे भाई बहन इस कोरोना के संकट में प्रभावित हुए हैं कई परिवार प्रभावित हुए हैं कईयों ने अपनी जान भी गवाई है मैं ऐसे सभी परिवारों के प्रति अपनी संवेदनशीलता प्रकट करता हूं और इस कोरोना के खिलाफ मुझे विश्वास है 130 करोड़ देशवासियों की अदम्य इच्छा शक्ति संकल्प शक्ति हमें उसमें भी विजय दिलाएगी और हम विजयी होके रहेंगे मुझे विश्वास है कि पिछले दिनों भी हम एक प्रकार से अनेक संकटों से गुजर रहे बाढ़ का प्रकोप खास करके दौड़ते इस पूर्वी भारत दक्षिण भारत पश्चिमी भारत के कुछ इलाके कहीं लैंडस्लाइड अनेक दिक्कतों का सामना लोगों को करना पड़ा है अनेक लोगों ने अपनी जान गवाई है मैं उन परिवारों के प्रति भी मेरी संवेदना व्यक्त करता हूं और राज्य सरकारों के साथ कंधे से कंधा मिलाकर के ऐसी संकट की घड़ी में हमेशा देश एक बन करके चाहे केंद्र सरकार हो राज्य सरकार हो हम मिलकर के तत्काल जितनी भी मदद पहुंचाने का प्रयास कर सकते हैं सफलतापूर्वक कर रहे हैं मेरे प्यारे देशवासियों आजादी का पर्व हमारे लिए ये स्वतंत्रता का पर्व आजादी के वीरों को याद कर करके नए संकल्पों की ऊर्जा का एक अवसर होता है एक प्रकार से हमारे लिए ये नई प्रेरणा लेकर के आता है नया उमंग नया उत्साह लेकर के आता है और इस बार तो हमारे लिए संकल्प करना बहुत आवश्यक भी है और बहुत शुभ अवसर भी है क्योंकि अगला जब हम आजादी का पर्व मनाएंगे तब हम 75 वर्ष में प्रवेश करेंगे यह अपने आप में एक बहुत बड़ा अवसर है और इसलिए आज आने वाले दो साल के लिए बहुत बड़े संकल्प लेकर के हमें चलना है 130 करोड़ देशवासियों को चलना है आजादी के 75 वर्ष में जब प्रवेश करेंगे और आजादी के 75 वर्ष जब पूर्ण होंगे हम हमारे संकल्पों की पूर्ति का एक महापर्व के रूप में उसको भी मनाएंगे मेरे प्यारे देशवासियों हमारे पूर्वजों ने अखंड एक निष्ठ तपस्या करके त्याग और बलिदान की उच्च भावनाओं को प्रस्तावित करते हुए हमें जिस प्रकार से आजादी दिलाई है उन्होंने न्यौछावक कर दिया है लेकिन हम ये बात न भूले कि गुलामी के इतने लंबे कालखंड में कोई भी पल ऐसा नहीं था कोई भी क्षेत्र ऐसा नहीं था कि जब आजादी की ललक न उठी हो आजादी की इच्छा को लेकर के किसी ने किसी ने प्रयास न किया हो जंग न किया हो त्याग न किया हो और एक प्रकार से 
जवानी जेलों में खपा दी जीवन के सारे सपनों को फांसी के फंदों को चूम करके आहूत कर दिया ऐसे वीरों को नमन करते हुए और फिर एक तरफ सशस्त्र क्रांति का दौर दूसरी तरफ जन आंदोलन का दौर पूज्य बापू के नेतृत्व में राष्ट्र जागरण के साथ जन आंदोलन की एक धारा ने आजादी के आंदोलन को एक नई ऊर्जा दी और हम आजादी के पर्व को आज मना पा रहे हैं इस आजादी के जंग में भारत की आत्मा को कुचलने के भी निरंतर प्रयास हुए हैं अनगिनत प्रयास हुए हैं भारत को अपनी संस्कृति परंपरा रीत रिवाज इन सब से उखाड़ फेंकने के लिए क्या कुछ नहीं हुआ वो कालखंड था सैकड़ों सालों का कालखंड था शाम दाम दंड भेद सब कुछ अपने चरम पर था और कुछ लोग तो ये मान के चलते थे कि हम तो यावत चंद्र दिवा करो यहां पर राज करने के लिए आए हैं लेकिन आजादी की ललक ने उनके सारे मंसूबों को जमीन दोस्त कर दिया उनकी सोच थी कि इतना बड़ा विशाल देश अनेक राजे रजवाड़े भांति भांति की बोलियां पहनवे खान पान अनेक भाषाएं इतनी विविधताओं के कारण बिखरा हुआ देश कभी एक होकर के आजादी का जंग लड़ नहीं सकता है लेकिन इस देश की प्राण शक्ति वो पहचान नहीं पाए अंतर्भूत जो प्राण शक्ति है एक ताता सूत्र जो हमें सबको बांध करके रखा हुआ है उसने आजादी के उस पर्व में पूरी ताकत के साथ जब वो मैदान में आया तो देश आजादी के जंग में विजयी हुआ हम ये भी जानते हैं कि वो कालखंड था विस्तारवाद की सोच वालों ने दुनिया में जहां भी फैल सकते के फैलने का प्रयास किया अपने झंडे गाड़ने की कोशिश की लेकिन भारत का आजादी का आंदोलन दुनिया के अंदर भी एक प्रेरणा का कुंज बन गया दिव्य स्तंभ बन गया और दुनिया में भी आजादी की ललक जगी और जो लोग विस्तारवाद के अंधी दौड़ में लगे हुए थे अपने झंडे गाड़ने में लगे थे उन्होंने अपने इस मनसूबों को विस्तारवाद के मनसूबों को पार करने के लिए दुनिया को दो दो महाविश्व युद्ध में झोंक दिया मानवता को तहस नहस कर दिया जिंदगी तबाह कर दी दुनिया को तबाह कर दिया लेकिन ऐसे कालखंड में भी युद्ध वेलकम बैक एवरीवन एंड नाउ इट्स टाइम फॉर रिकी केज एज प्रॉमिस लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन द ग्रामी अवार्ड विनिंग म्यूजिक कंपोजर प्रोड्यूसर एंड एनवायरमेंटलिस्ट ही इज कोलैबोरेटेड विद सम फैंटास्टिक आर्टिस्ट्स टू पुट टुगेदर दिस वर्चुअल कॉन्सर्ट फॉर यू कैप्चरिंग सम ट्रूली ओरिजिनल वॉइसेस फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द लैंड and a rendition of the national anthem we promise you've never heard before the anthem is dedicated to the true citizens of india who they are is a bit of a surprise so you will not want to miss a second of this so do stay tuned and enjoy the concert Namaste and a happy Independence Day. Now let us kick start today's concert for the Nudge Foundation with an anthem for a better tomorrow, a brighter, more beautiful future for everyone and everything. 
Now joining me are the awesome Benny Dayal and Jonita Gandhi. Here is Jago. Jago Pada enjoyed that song now i'm ricky cage and i'm honored to perform this virtual concert for you now this is my second time performing for the nudge foundation and i absolutely believe in them now as some of you may know i'm a very strong advocate of the united nations sustainable development goals and i love the fact that the nudge foundation is a platform to build a strong narrative for india's developmental sector and inspire belief in our collective ability to stay the course towards the united nations sustainable development goals now our next song is a song about food. 
It's a song about the people who grow our food, our farmers. Now for this song, I collaborated with the tribal farmers from the most remote regions of Andhra Pradesh who grow food in the most natural way. Now they are also brilliant musicians and sing songs passed down from generation to generation about nature and coexistence. And also collaborating and joining with me on this song is the awesome Anushka Manchanda. Here is our next song, it's called Jai Kisan. tribute to our farmers. Now our next song is a song sung from the perspective of a child. Now she is asking her parents, what have you done to this world? Why have you not left any beauty in this world for me, my siblings and my future generations to enjoy? At least leave me a planet where I'm able to breathe clean air. Now this song is sung by the amazing and soulful Khatija Rahman. Here is Iltija.
amazing what a beautiful voice now over to our next song last year i was honored when the united nations convention to combat desertification announced me as their land ambassador now the unccd is doing wonderful work around the world to restore lands and livelihoods and thus mitigating the effects of climate change now the united nations estimates that land degradation will displace 135 million people by 2045 and of course, land restoration is the cheapest solution to mitigating the effects of climate change. Now, joining me for this song are the Indian superstars Kailash Kher and Salim Merchant. Here is the official UNCCD land anthem in Hindi. Here is Mitti. वही है घर जहाँ डर हो ना फीकर मिट्टी की जहाँ आए खुशबू जहाँ खाब हो फलक पर और सांसों में सबर जहाँ खुद से हो तू रूबरू जो देखे कभी सोचे तो जान ले है कितना खुश किस्मत तू Celebrate the joy of life Oh, we're born from the land Oh, you and I and all of life Oh, we're born from the land Let's celebrate the joy बंदे जरा तो रुख मिलता यही सब कुछ 
हथेड़ों की जाओ में हर सुख सारी अपनी समय कभी होगी ना कभी सबको करती मोहब्बत धरती जो देखे कमी सोचे तो जान ले कितना सुंदर मन तेरे पैरांदे है थल्ले पे यार सोचता जरा उस तरह हो दुनिया हो वे जिस तरह Now during these tough and dark times all of us need to shine a light to everyone around us. Our next song is about spreading kindness and solidarity. Now joining me are the legendary father and son duo Udit Narayan and Aditya Narayan. I'm so proud to be performing with these amazing amazing singers. Here is Shine Your Light. हम सब साथ यहाँ हैं, हम सब साथ यहाँ हैं, कोई फर्क कहाँ है, कोई फर्क कहाँ है? चलो हाथ बढ़ाए, चलो सबको दिखाए, कोई भी यहाँ अकेला ना है। जो साथ निभाऊं तू जो साथ निभाए तो बात बन जाए तो ये रात ढल जाए मैं जो साथ निभाऊं तू जो साथ निभाए तो बात बन जाए तो ये रात ढल जाए चलो हाथ बढ़ाए चलो सबको दिखाए कोई भी यहाँ अकेला ना है। Let's do this. It's our time. Let's do this. It's time. 
again to all of you now as a musician i love the composition of our indian national anthem and we created an instrumental version dedicated to our country's true citizens now who are the true citizens the forests and wildlife because they have existed on our land long before any humans had ever set foot here now india is much more than just humans and i'm sure you agree with me on that so if you would please indulge me let us all rise for the true citizens of india let us all rise for the indian national anthem Just wow, um, goosebumps, right? Uh, lots of gratitude to you, Ricky, and your team, and all the musicians who've collaborated and made this such a special concert and an amazing way to kick off our Independence Day. For all our attendees enjoying uh, watching the sessions, get an even richer event experience, network with other attendees, engage in discussions, and much more by downloading the Attendify app. Uh, look for the Nudge Forum and log in there. Coming up, um, we have the India Daytime Opening Address by uh, Padma Bhushan, Mr. B. Muthuraman, sir. Uh, then we discuss the state of education uh, in India with uh, Ashish Dhawan, Madhav Chavan, moderated by Smarinita Shetty. And then we discuss economic development through equitable access to energy with uh, Ashwin Dayal, Dr. Ajay Mathur, Reema Anavati, moderated by Anjali Garg. This will be followed by the plenary address by Chief Scientist WHO, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. Then we listen to stories from the field and barriers to accessing health care by Dr. Aquinas. Uh, then we'll continue our discourse on health by discussing building resilience in India's primary health care system with Dr. Devi Shetty, Dr. Indu Bhushan, Ms. Preeti Sudhan, uh, moderated by Dr. Sanjeev Arora. And finally, the new education policy and the vision of No Child Left Behind with none other than Dr. Kasturi Rangan in conversation with Mohan Das Pai. This is the stellar lineup just till noon, uh, following which there will be 12 more hours of amazing conversations with just one agenda, a sustainable and inclusive development journey for India. To kick off sessions for the India audience now, uh, we're honored to have Mr. Muthuraman for the India Daytime opening address, 
quick introduction. Uh, Mr. Muthuraman uh, is a member of the board at the Naj Foundation. We're lucky to have his support. Uh, he has held various leadership positions at Tata Steel, including as vice president and managing director. He served on the boards of Bosch India and Tata Industries.